Hello. Today is an act of solidarity with those protesting police brutality and racism across the country. We present the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in its entirety, read by some of America's great writers, scholars, and activists. As an institution with a mission to celebrate great writers of our past, we put forward an exhibit on Douglass in 2018 to honor the bicentennial of his birth because he is the epitome of what we celebrate as an institution, a writer who literally shaped the mindset and actions of a country through his words. The reading is one thing we thought we could do today to remind people of the deep roots of systemic racism built into the fabric of this country. We will seek to continue to do our work to celebrate the great writers of our past, to promote the writers of today, and hopefully through these actions, inspire great writers of the future. We do this because we know that Black Lives Matter and we know that Black voices have moved this country forward. In introducing readers to the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in 1845, abolitionist Henry Lloyd Garrison wrote remarks directed at white people who didn't believe the true stories of the horrors of slavery. They affect to be greatly indignant at such enormous exaggerations, such wholesale misstatements, such abominable libels on the character of Southern planters, he said. Such will try to discredit the shocking tales of slaveholding cruelty, which are recorded in this truthful narrative, but they will labor in vain. Garrison believed that Douglas's writing would open white people's eyes to the reality confronting black Americans and that they would be moved to act for change. It is a belief we hold at the American Writers Museum today that writing is critical for social change and that no injustice will be hidden so long as writers are free to write. We hope that as you listen to these words over 175 years after they were first published, you understand the depth of the pain and cruelty upon which our country was built and how far we have yet to go to meet the true hopes of equality that Douglas spent his life fighting and writing for. More than that, we hope that you will hear the demands for dignity today, echoing the words of history and take up the cause of dismantling white supremacy for which Douglas had a simple command. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Thank you. I want to thank the American Writers Museum for doing this reading of Frederick Douglass today because the nation is going through a very difficult time. Um, I'm 78 years old, and been a part of this struggle, the black struggle, the progressive struggle all my adult life. But even coming up as a young man, we knew that the murder of black people was going on, but we didn't have a telephone, so they had a cell phone. So now, as I read uh, this narrative from Frederick Douglass, I'd like to most certainly say, on behalf of the American Writers Museum, we're thinking about Sandra Blind, George Floyd. We're thinking about Eric Garner and Tamir Rice, Amadou Diallo, Rihanna Taylor. In fact, Sister Taylor will be 27 today. Today is her birthday. We're thinking about Trevon Martin, Ramad Arbery, Michael Brown, Philando Castillo, Laquan McDonald, and many others. But also we are thinking about those statues in Richmond, Virginia that are being torn down now of Robert E. Lee and all those traitors across the South. We must never forget that the Civil War was a war with the South who had broke away from the states. And so therefore Robert E. Lee was a traitor as well as the other men and some women who fought. And so the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass is a statement that all young people, and not so young people, should understand. The book should be read in high schools and in colleges and universities and community colleges across the country. And for 40, my 42 years in teaching in academia, I use the narrative many times. The narrative of Frederick, the life of Frederick Douglass, chapter one. I was born in Tuckahoe, near Hillsboro and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing that. 
By far the larger part of the slaves know as little of their age as horses know of theirs. And it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, spring time, or fall time. A warrant of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me, even during childhood. The white children could tell their ages. I cannot tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. I was not allowed to make any inquiries of my master concerning it. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of a slave improper and impertinent, and evidence of a restless spirit. The nearest estimate I can give makes me now between 27 and 28 years of age. I come to this from hearing my master say sometime during 1835, I was about 17 years old. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was a daughter of Isaac and Bessie Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was, my mother was darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parentage. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father. But of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I knew her as my mother. It is a common custom in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age frequently before the child has reached its 12th month. His mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off. And the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old for field labor. But what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection towards its mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable results. I never saw my mother to know her as such more than four or five times in my life. And each of these times was very short in duration and at night. She was hired by Mr. Stewart, who lived about 12 miles from my home. She made her journeys to see me in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. She was a field hand, and a whipping is the penalty of not being in the field at sunrise, unless a slave has special permission from his or her master to the contrary, a permission which they seldom get, and one that gives to him that gives it the proud name of being a kind master. I do not recollect of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me in the night. She would lie down with me and get me to sleep. But long before I wake, she was gone. Very little communication ever took place between us. Death soon ended what little we could have while she lived. And with it, her hardships and suffering. She died when I was about seven years old. One of my master's farms near Lee's Mill. I was not allowed to be present during her illness, at her death, or burial. She was gone long before I knew anything about it. Never having enjoyed, to any considerable extent, her soothing presence, her tender, watchful care. I received the tidings of her death with much the same emotion I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. Called thus suddenly away, she left me without the slightest 
an intimation of who my father was. The whisper that my master was my father may not be true. And truth or false, it is of but little consequence to my purpose, whilst the fact remain in all its glaring odiousness. The slaveholders have ordained and by law established that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the conditions of their mothers. And thus is done to obviously to be administered to their own lusts and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable. For by this cunning arrangement, the slave holder, in case it's not a few, sustained to his slaves a double relation of master and father. I know of such cases, and it's worthy of remark that such slaves inevitably suffer greater hardships and have more to contend with than others. They are, in the first place, a constant offense to their mistress. She is never disposed to find fault with them. They can set them do anything to please her. She is never better pleased when she sees them under the lash, especially when she suspects her husband of showing to his mulatto children favors which he withheld from his black slaves. The master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife. And cruel as a deed may strike anyone to be, for a man to sell his own children to human flesh mongers, it is often the dictate of humanity for him to do so. But unless he does this, he must not only whoop him himself, he must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother of but few shades darker complexion than himself and ply the gory lash to his naked back. And if he slips one word of disapproval, is set down to his parental partiality. It only makes a bad matter worse, both for himself and the slave whom he would protect and defend. Every year, with as multitudes of this class of slaves, it was doubtless in consequence of a knowledge of this fact that one great statesman of the South predicted the downfall of slavery by the inevitable law of population. Whether this prophecy is ever fulfilled or not, it is nevertheless plain that a very different looking class of people are springing up at the South and are now held in slavery from those originally brought to this country from Africa. And if their increase do no other good, it will do away the force of the argument that God cursed Ham and th therefore American slavery is right. If the lineage descendants of Ham are alone to be scripturally enslaved, it is certain that slavery at the South must soon become unscriptural, for thousands are ushered into the world annually who, like myself, owe their existence to white fathers, and those fathers most frequently their own masters. I've had two masters. My first master's name was Anthony. I do not remember his first name. He was generally called Captain Anthony a title which I presume he acquired by selling a craft on the Chesapeake Bay. He was not considered a rich slaveholder. He owned two or three farms and about 30 slaves. His farms and slaves were under the care of an overseer. The overseer's name was Plummer. Mr. Plummer was a miserable drunkard, a profane swear, and a savage monster. He always went armed with a cow skin and a heavy cauldron. I've known him to cut and slash the women's head so horribly that even master would be enraged at his cruelty. A 
and would threaten to whip him if he did not mind himself. Master, however, was not a humane slave owner. He required extraordinary barbarity on the part of an overseer to affect him. He was a cruel man, hardened by a long life of slaveholding. He would at times seem to take great pleasure in whooping a slave. I have often been awakened at the dawn of day by the most heart-rending shrieks of an own aunt of mine, whom he used to tie up to a joist and whip upon her naked back till she was literally covered with blood. No words, no tears, no prayers from his gory victim seemed to move his iron heart from his bloody purpose. The louder she screamed, the harder he whipped. And where the blood ran fastest, there he whipped longest. He would whip her to make her scream and whip her to make her hush. And not until overcome by fatigue would he cease to swing the blood cloth cow skin. I remember the first time I ever witnessed this horrible exposition. I was quite a child, but I will remember it. I never shall forget it once I remember anything. It was the first of a long series of such outrages of which I was doomed to be a witness and a participant. It struck me with awful force. It was a bloodstained gate, the entrance to the hell of slavery, through which I was about to pass. It was the most terrible spectacle. I wish I could commit to paper the feelings with which I beheld it. This occurrence took place very soon after I went to live with my old master and under the following circumstances. And Esther went out one night, where or for what I do not know, it happened to be absent when my master desired her presence. He had ordered her not to go out evenings and warned her that she must never let him catch her in company with a young man who was paying attention to her, belonging to Colonel Lloyd. The young man's name was Ned Roberts, Jimmy called Lloyd's Ned. My master was so careful of her, may be safely left to conjecture. She was a woman of noble form and of graceful proportion, having very few equals and fewer superiors in performing personal appearance among the colored or white women of our neighborhood. Aunt Hester had not only disobeyed his orders in going out, but had been found in company with Lord's Ned, which circumstance I found from what he said while whipping her was a chief offense. Had he been a man of pure moral, morals himself, he might have felt interested in protecting the innocence of my aunt. But those who knew him would not suspect him of any such virtue. Before he commenced whipping Aunt Hester, he took her into the kitchen and stripped her neck to waist, leaving her neck, shoulders, and back entirely naked. He then told her to cross her hands and back entirely naked, calling her at the same time a damn bitch. After crossing her hands, he tied them with a strong rope and led her to stool under a large hook in the jaws, put in for the purpose. He made her get up upon the stool and tied her hands to the hook. She now stood fair for his infernal purpose. Her arms were stretched up at their full length so that she stood upon the ends of her toes. He then said to her, now you devil bitch, I'll learn you how to disobey my orders. And after rolling up his sleeves, he missed to lay on the heavy cow skin and soon the warm red blood amid heart-rending shrieks from her and horrid oaths from him came dripping to the floor. 
I was terrified and horror stricken at the sight. And I hid myself in a closet and dare not venture out till long after the bloody transaction was over. I expected it would be my turn next. It was all new to me. I never seen anything like it before. I had always lived with my grandmother on the outskirts of the plantation where she was put to raise the children of the younger women. I had therefore been until now out of the way of the bloody scenes that often occur on the plantation which is chapter one of the narrative of Trinidad. Doctors. My master's family consisted of two sons, Andrew and Richard, one daughter, Lucretia, and their husband, Captain Thomas All. They lived in one house upon the home plantation of Colonel Edward Lloyd. My master was Colonel Lloyd's clerk and superintendent. He was what might be called the overseer of the overseers. I spent two years of childhood on this plantation in my old master's family. It was here that I witnessed the bloody transaction recorded in the first chapter. And as I received my first impressions of slavery on this plantation, I will give some description of it and of slavery as it there existed. The plantation is about 12 miles north of Easton in Talbot County and is situated on the border of Miles River. The principal products raised upon it were tobacco, corn, and wheat. These were raised in great abundance so that with the products of this and the other farms belonging to him, he was able to keep in almost constant employment a large sloop in carrying them to market in Baltimore. His sloop was named Sally Lloyd in honor of one of the Colonel's daughters. My master's son-in-law, Captain Alb, was a master of the vessel. She was otherwise manned by the Colonel's own slaves. Their names were Peter, Isaac, Rich, and Jake. These were esteemed very highly by the other slaves and looked upon as the privileged ones of the plantation for it was no small affair in the eyes of the slaves to be allowed to see Baltimore. Colonel Lloyd kept from three to 400 slaves on his home plantation and owned a large number more on the neighboring farms belonging to him. The names of the farms nearest the home plantation were Y-Town and New Design. Y-Town was under the overship of a man named Noah Willis. New Design was under the overship of a Mr. Townsend. The overseers of these and all the rest of the farms, numbering over 20, received advice and direction from the managers of the home plantation. This was the great business place. It was the seat of government for the whole 20 farms. All disputes among the overseers were settled here. If a slave was convicted of any high misdemeanor, became unmanageable or evinced the determination to run away, he was brought immediately here, severely whipped, put on board the sloop, carried to Baltimore, and sold to Austin Woolfolk or some other slave driver as a warning to the slaves remaining. Here too, the slaves of all the other farms received their monthly allowance of food and their yearly clothing. The women and men slaves received as their monthly allowance of food, eight pounds of pork or its equivalent in fish, and one bushel of cornmeal. Their yearly clothing consisted of two coarse linen shirts, one pair of linen trousers, like the shirts, one jacket, one pair of trousers for winter, made of coarse Negro cloth, one pair of stockings, and one pair of shoes, the whole of which could not have cost more than seven dollars. The allowance of the slave children was given to their mothers, or the old women having the care of them. 
The children, unable to work in the field, had neither shoes, stockings, jackets, nor trousers given to them. Their clothing consisted of two coarse linen shirts per year. When these failed them, they went naked until the next allowance. Children from seven to 10 years old of both sexes, almost naked, might be seen at all seasons of the year. There were no beds given the slaves unless one coarse blanket be considered such. And none but the men and women had these. This, however, is not considered a very great privation. They find less difficulty from the want of beds than from the want of time to sleep. For when their day's work in the field is done, and most of them having their washing, mending, and cooking to do, and having few or none of the ordinary facilities for doing either of these, very many of their sleeping hours are consumed in preparing for the field the coming day. And when this is done, old and young, male and female, married and single, drop down side by side on one common bed, a cold, damp floor, each covering himself or herself with their miserable blankets. And here they sleep, though they are summoned to the field by the driver's horn. At the sound of this, all must rise and be off to the field. There must be no halting. Everyone must be at his or her post. And woe betides them who hear not this morning summons to the field. For if they are not awakened by the sense of hearing, they are by the sense of feeling. No age nor sex finds any favor. Mr. Severe, the overseer, used to stand by the door of the quarter armed with a large hickory stick and heavy cowskin, ready to whip anyone who was so unfortunate as not to hear or from any other cause was prevented from being ready to start for the field at the sound of the horn. Mr. Severe was rightly named. He was a cruel man. I've seen him whip a woman, causing the blood to run half an hour at the time. And this too in the midst of our crying children, pleading for their mother's release. He seemed to take pleasure in manifesting his fiendish barbarity. And to his cruelty, he was a profane swearer. It was enough to chill the blood and stiffen the hair of an ordinary man to hear him talk. Scarce a sentence escaped him, but that was commenced or concluded by some horrid oath. The field was the place to witness his cruelty and profanity. His presence made it both the field of blood and of blasphemy. From the rising till the going down of the sun, he was cursing, raving, cutting, slashing among the slaves of the field in the most frightful manner. His career was short. He died very soon after I went to Colonel Lloyd's. And he died as he lived, uttering with his dying groans, bitter curses and horrid oaths. His death was regarded by the slaves as a result of a merciful providence. Mr. Severe's place was filled by Mr. Hopkins. He was a very different man. He was less cruel, less profane, and made less noise than Mr. Severe. His course was characterized by no extraordinary demonstrations of cruelty. He whipped. He seemed to take no pleasure in it. He was called by the slaves a good overseer. The home plantation of Colonel Lloyd wore the appearance of a country village. All the mechanical operations for all the farms were performed here. The shoemaking and mending, the blacksmithing, cartwrighting, coopering, weaving, and grain grinding. 
all were performed by the slaves on the home plantation. The whole place wore a business-like aspect, very unlike the neighboring farms. The number of houses, too, conspired to give an advantage over the neighboring farms. It was called by the slaves, the Great House Farm. Few privileges were esteemed higher by the slaves of the out farms than that of being selected to do errands at the Great House Farm. It was associated in their minds with greatness. A representative could not be prouder of his election to a seat in the American Congress than a slave on one of the out farms would be of his election to do errands at the Great House Farm. They regarded it as evidence of great confidence reposed in them by their overseers. And it was on this account, as well as a constant desire to be out of the field from under the driver's lash, that they esteemed it a high privilege, one worth careful living for. He was called the smartest and most trusty fellow who had this honor conferred upon him the most frequently. The competitors for this office sought as diligently to please their overseers as the office seekers in the political parties seek to please and deceive the people. The same traits of character might be seen in Colonel Lloyd's slaves as are seen in the slaves of the political parties. The slaves selected to go to the Great House Farm for the monthly allowance for themselves and their fellow slaves were peculiarly enthusiastic. While on their way, they would make the dense old woods for miles around reverberate with their wild songs, revealing at once the highest joy and the deepest sadness. They would compose and sing as they went along, consulting neither time nor tune. The thought that came up, came out. If not in the word, in the sound. And as frequently in the one as in the other. They would sometimes sing the most pathetic sentiment in the most rapturous tone. And the most rapturous sentiment in the most pathetic tone. Into all of their songs, they would manage to weave something of the great house farm. Especially would they do this when leaving home. They would then sing most exultingly the following words. I am going away to the great house farm. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh. This they would sing as a chorus to words which to many would seem unmeaning jargon, but which nevertheless were full of meaning to themselves. I have sometimes thought that the mere hearing of those songs would do more to impress some minds the horrible character of slavery than the reading of whole volumes of philosophy on the subject could do. I did not, when a slave, understand the deep meaning of those rude and apparently incoherent songs. I was myself within the circle, so that I neither saw nor heard as those without might see and hear. They told a tale of woe, which was then altogether beyond my feeble comprehension. They were tones loud, long, and deep. They breathed the prayer and compliant of souls boiling over with the bitterish anguish. Every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance from chains. The hearing of those wild notes always depressed my spirit and filled me with ineffable sadness. I frequently found myself in tears while hearing them. The mere recurrence of those songs, even now, afflicts me. And while I'm writing these lines, an expression of feeling has already found its way down my cheek. To those songs, 
I trace my first glimmering conception of the dehumanizing character of slavery. I can never get rid of that conception. Those songs still follow me to deepen my hatred of slavery and quicken my sympathies for my brethren in bonds. If anyone wishes to be impressed with the soul-killing effects of slavery, let him go to Colonel Lloyd's plantation and on allowance day, place himself in the deep pine woods. And there, let him in silence analyze the sounds that shall pass through the chambers of his soul. And if he is not thus impressed, it will only be because, quote, there is no flesh in his obdurate heart, unquote. I've often been utterly astonished since I came to the North to find persons who could speak of the singing among slaves as evidence of their contentment and happiness. It is impossible to conceive of a greater mistake. Slaves sing most when they are most unhappy. The songs of the slave represent the sorrows of his heart, and he is relieved by them only as an aching heart is relieved by its tears. At least, such is my experience. I have often sung to drown my sorrow, but seldom to express my happiness. Crying for joy and singing for joy were alike uncommon to me while in the jaws of slavery. The singing of a man cast away upon a desolate island might be as appropriately considered as evidence of contentment and happiness as the singing of a slave. The songs of the one and of the other are prompted by the same emotion. The end, chapter two, of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, written by himself. Chapter three. Colonel Lloyd kept a large and finely cultivated garden, which afforded almost constant employment for four men besides the chief gardener, Mr. M. Dermott. This garden was probably the greatest attraction of the place. During the summer months, people came from far and near, from Baltimore, Easton, and Annapolis to see it. It abounded in fruits of almost every description, from the hardy apple of the north to the delicate orange of the south. This garden was not the least source of trouble on the plantation. Its excellent fruit was quite a temptation to the hungry swarms of boys as well as the older slaves belonging to the colonel, few of whom had the virtue or the vice to resist it. Scarcely a day passed during the summer, but that some slave had to take the lash for stealing fruit. The colonel had to resort to all kinds of stratagems to keep his slaves out of the garden. The last and most successful was that of tarring his fence all around, after which, if a slave was caught with any tar upon his person, it was deemed sufficient proof that he had either been into the garden or had tried to get in. In either case, he was severely whipped by the chief gardener. This plan worked well. The slaves became as fearful of tar as of the lash. They seemed to realize the impossibility of touching tar without being defiled. The colonel also kept a splendid riding equipage. His stable and carriage house 
presented the appearance of some of our large city livery establishments. His horses were of the finest form and noblest blood. His carriage house contained three splendid coaches, three or four gigs, besides Dearborns and Barouches of the most fashionable style. This establishment was under the care of two slaves, Old Barney and Young Barney, father and son. To attend to this establishment was their sole work, but it was by no means an easy employment for in nothing was Colonel Lloyd more particular than in the management of his horses. The slightest inattention to these was unpardonable and was visited upon those under whose care they were placed with the severest punishment. No excuse could shield them. If the Colonel only suspected any want of attention to his horses, a supposition which he frequently indulged, and one which, of course, made the office of old and young Barney a very trying one. They never knew when they were safe from punishment. They were frequently whipped when least deserving and escaped whipping when most deserving it. Everything depended upon the looks of the horses and the state of Colonel Lloyd's own mind when his horses were brought to him for use. If a horse did not move fast enough or hold his head high enough, it was owing to some fault of his keepers. It was painful to stand near the stable door and hear the various complaints against the keepers when a horse was taken out for use. This horse has not had proper attention. He has not been sufficiently rubbed and curried, or he has not been properly fed. His food was too wet or too dry. He got it too soon or too late. He was too hot or too cold. He had too much hay and not enough of grain, or he had too much grain and not enough of hay. Instead of old Barney's attending to the horse, he had very improperly left it to his son. To all these complaints, no matter how unjust, the slave must answer never a word. Colonel Lloyd could not brook any contradiction from a slave. When he spoke, a slave must stand, listen, and tremble. And such was literally the case. I have seen Colonel Lloyd make old Barney, a man between 50 and 60 years of age, uncover his bald head, kneel down upon the cold, damp ground, and receive upon his naked and toil-worn shoulders more than 30 lashes at the time. Colonel Lloyd had three sons, Edward, Murray, and Daniel, and three sons-in-laws, Mr. Winder, Mr. Nicholson, and Mr. Lowndes. All of these lived at the Great House Farm and enjoyed the luxury of whipping the servants when they pleased from old Barney down to William Wilkes, the coach driver. I have seen Winder make one of the house servants stand off from him a suitable distance to be touched with the end of his whip and at every stroke raise great ridges upon his back. To describe the wealth of Colonel Lloyd would be almost equal to describing the riches of Job. He kept from 10 to 15 house servants. He was said to own a thousand slaves, and I think this estimate quite within the truth. Colonel Lloyd owned so many that he did not know them when he saw them, nor did all the slaves of the out farms know him. It is reported of him that while riding along the road one day, he met a colored man and addressed him in the usual manner of speaking to colored people on the public highways of the South. Well, boy, whom do you belong to? To Colonel Lloyd, replied the slave. Well, does the Colonel treat you well? No, sir, was the ready reply. What, does he work you too hard? Yes, sir. Well, don't he give you enough to eat? 
Yes, sir, he gives me enough such as it is. The colonel, after ascertaining where the slave belonged, rode on. The man also went on about his business, not dreaming that he had been conversing with his master. He thought, said, and heard nothing more of the matter until two or three weeks afterwards. The poor man was then informed by his overseer that for having found fault with his master, he was now to be sold to a Georgia trader. He was immediately chained and handcuffed and thus, without a moment's warning, he was snatched away and forever sundered from his family and friends by a hand more unrelenting than death. This is the penalty of telling the truth, of telling the simple truth in answer to a series of plain questions. It is partly in consequence of such facts the slaves, when inquired of as to their condition and the character of their masters, almost universally say they are contented and that their masters are kind. The slaveholders have been known to send in spies among their slaves to ascertain their views and feelings in regard to their condition. The frequency of this has had the effect to establish among slaves the maxim that a still tongue makes a wise head. They suppress the truth rather than take the consequences of telling it, and in so doing, prove themselves a part of the human family. If they have anything to say of their masters, it is generally in their master's favor, especially when speaking to an untried man. I have been frequently asked when a slave if I had a kind master and do not remember ever to have given a negative answer, nor did I, in pursuing this course, consider myself as uttering what was absolutely false. For I always measured the kindness of my master by the standard of kindness set up among slaveholders around us. Moreover, slaves are like other people and imbibe prejudice quite common to others. They think their own better than that of others. Many, under the influence of this prejudice, think their own masters are better than the masters of other slaves. And this too, in some cases, when the very reverse is true. Indeed, it is not uncommon for slaves even to fall out and quarrel among themselves about the relative goodness of their masters, each contending for the superior goodness of his own over that of the others. At the very same time, they mutually execrate their masters when viewed separately. It was so on our plantation. When Colonel Lloyd's slaves met the slaves of Jacob Jepson, they seldom parted without a quarrel about their masters. Colonel Lloyd's slaves contending that he was the richest and Mr. Jepson's slaves that he was the smartest and most of a man. Colonel Lloyd's slaves would boast his ability to buy and sell Jacob Jepson. Mr. Jepson's slaves would boast his ability to whip Colonel Lloyd. These quarrels would almost always end in a fight between the parties and those that whipped were supposed to have gained the point at issue. They seemed to think that the greatness of their masters was transferable to themselves. It was considered as being bad enough to be a slave, but to be a poor man's slave was deemed a disgrace indeed. Chapter 4 Mr. Hopkins remained but a short time in the office of overseer. Why his career was so short, I do not know. But suppose he lacked the necessary severity to suit Colonel Lloyd. Mr. Hopkins was succeeded by Mr. Austin Gore, a man possessing, in an eminent degree, all those traits of character indispensable to what is called a first-rate overseer. 
Mr. Gore had served Colonel Lloyd in the capacity of overseer upon one of the out farms and had shown himself worthy of the high station of overseer upon the home or great house farm. Mr. Gore was proud, ambitious, and persevering. He was artful, cruel, and obdurate. He was just such, he was just the man for such a place. And it was just the place for such a man. It afforded scope for the full exercise of all of his powers, and he seemed to be perfectly at home in it. He was one of those who could torture the slightest look, word, or gesture on the part of the slave into impudence and would treat it accordingly. There must be no answering back to him. No explanation was allowed a slave, showing himself to have been wrongfully accused. Mr. Gore acted fully up to the maximum laid down by the slaveholders. It is better that a dozen slaves should suffer under the lash than that the overseer should be convicted in the presence of the slaves of having been at fault. So, no matter how innocent a slave might be, it availed him nothing when accused by Mr. Gore of any misdemeanor. To be accused was to be convicted, and to be convicted was to be punished. The one always followed the other with the mutable certainty. To escape punishment was to escape accusation, and few slaves had the fortune to do either under the overseership of Mr. Gore. He was just proud enough to demand the most debasing homage of the slave and quite servile enough to crouch himself at the feet of the master. He was ambitious enough to be contented with nothing short of the highest rank of overseers and persevering enough to reach the height of his ambition. He was cruel enough to inflict the severest punishment artful enough to descend to the lowest trickery and abjured enough to be insensible to the voice of a reproving conscience. He was, of all the overseers, the most dreaded by the slaves. His presence was painful. His eye flashed confusion and seldom was his sharp shrill voice heard without producing horror and trembling in their ranks. Mr. Gore was a grave man, and though a young man, he indulged in no jokes, said no funny words, seldom smiled. His words were in perfect keeping with his looks, and his looks were in perfect keeping with his words. Overseers will sometimes indulge in a witty word or even with the slaves. Not so with Mr. Gore. He spoke but to command and commanded but to be obeyed. He dealt sparingly with his words and bountifully with his wit, never using the former where the latter would answer as well. When he whipped he seemed to do so from a sense of duty and feared no consequences. He did nothing reluctantly, no matter how disagreeable, always at his post, never inconsistent. He never promised but to fulfill. He was, in a word, a man of the most inflexible firmness and stone-like coolness. His savage barbarity was equaled only by the consummate coolness with which he committed the grossest and most savage deeds upon the slaves under his charge. Mr. Gore once undertook to whip one of Colonel Lloyd's slaves by the name of Demby. He had given Demby but few stripes 
when, to get rid of the scourging, he ran and plunged himself into a creek and stood there at the depth of his shoulders, refusing to come out. Mr. Gore told him that he would give him three calls and that if he did not come out at the third call, he would shoot him. The first call was given. Denby made no response, but stood his ground. The second and third calls were given with the same result. Mr. Gore, then, without consultation or deliberation with anyone, not even giving Denby an additional call, raised his musket to his face, taking deadly aim at his standing victim, and in an instant, poor Denby was no more. His mangled body sank out of sight, and blood and brains marked the water where he had stood. A thrill of horror flashed through every soul upon the plantation, excepting Mr. Gore. He alone seemed cool and collected. He was asked by Colonel Lloyd and my old master why he resorted to this extraordinary expedient. His reply was, as well as I can remember, that Denby had become unmanageable that he was setting a dangerous example to the other slaves, one which, if suffered to pass without some such demonstration on his part, would finally lead to the total subversion of all rule and order upon the plantation. He argued that if one slave refused to be corrected and escape with his life, the other slaves would soon copy the example, the result of which would be the freedom of the slaves and the enslavement of the whites. Mr. Gore's defense was satisfactory. He was continued in his station as overseer upon the home plantation. His fame as an overseer went abroad. His horrid crime was not even submitted to judicial investigation. It was committed in the presence of slaves, and they, of course, could neither institute a suit nor testify against him. And thus, the guilty perpetrator of one of the bloodiest and most foul murders goes unwhipped of justice and uncensured by the community in which he lives. Mr. Gore lived in St. Michael's, Talbot County, Maryland, when I left there. And if he's still alive, he very probably lives there now. And if so, he is now, as he was then, as highly esteemed and as much respected as though his guilty soul had not been stained with his brother's blood. I speak advisedly when I say this, that killing a slave or any colored person in Talbot County, Maryland is not treated as a crime, either by the courts or the community. Mr. Thomas Landman of St. Michael's killed two slaves, one of whom he killed with a hatchet by knocking his brains out. He used to boast of the commission of that awful and bloody deed. I have heard him do so laughingly, saying, among other things, that he was the only benefactor of his country in the company, and that when others would do as much as he had done, we should be relieved of the quote unquote, the damned N word. The wife of Mr. Giles Hicks, living but a short distance from where I used to live, murdered my wife's cousin, a young girl between 15 and 16 years of age, mangling her person in the most horrible manner, 
breaking her nose and breastbone with a stick so that the poor girl expired in a few hours afterward. She was immediately buried, but had not been in her untimely grave but a few hours before she was taken up and examined by the coroner who decided that she had come to her death by severe beating. The offense for which this girl was thus murdered was this. She had been set that night to mind Mrs. Hicks' baby, and during the night she fell asleep, and the baby cried. She, having lost her rest for several nights previous, did not hear the crying. They were both in a room with Mrs. Hicks. Mrs. Hicks, finding the girl slow to move, jumped from her bed, seized an oak stick of wood by the fireplace, and with it broke the girl's nose and her breastbone, and thus ended her life. I will not say that this most horrid murder produced no sensation in the community. It did produce sensation but not enough to bring the murderess to punishment. There was a warrant issued for her arrest, but it was never served. Thus she escaped not only punishment, but even the pain of being arraigned before a court for her horrid crime. Whilst I am detailing bloody deeds, which took place during my stay on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, I will briefly narrate another, which occurred about the same time as the murder of Denby by Mr. Gore. Colonel Lloyd's slaves were in the habit of spending a part of their nights and Sundays in fishing for oysters, and in this way made up the deficiency of their scanty allowance. An old man belonging to Colonel Lloyd, while thus engaged, happened to get beyond the limits of Colonel Lloyd's and on the premises of Mr. Beale Bonley. At this trespass, Mr. Bonley took offense and with his musket came down to the shore and blew its deadly contents into the poor old man. Mr. Bonley came over to see Colonel Lloyd the next day, whether to pay him for his property or to justify himself in what he had done, I know not. At any rate, this whole fiendish transaction was soon just hushed up. There was very little said about it at all and nothing done. It was a common saying, even among little white boys, that it was worth a half cent to kill a quote unquote N-word and a half cent to bury one. Chapter five, as to my own treatment while I lived on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, it was very similar to that of the other slave children. I was not old enough to work in the field and there being little else than field work to do, I had a great deal of leisure time. The most I had to do was to drive up the cows at evening, keep the fowls out of the garden, keep the front yard clean and run of errands for my old master's daughter, Mrs. Lucretia Ald. The most of my leisure time I spent in helping Master Daniel Lloyd in finding his birds after he had shot them. My connection with Master Daniel was of some advantage to me. He became quite attached to me, was a sort of protector of me. He would not allow the older boys to impose upon me and would divide his cakes with me. I was seldom whipped by my old master and suffered little from anything else than hunger and cold. I suffered much from hunger, but much more from cold. In hottest summer and coldest winter, I was kept almost naked, no shoes, no stockings, no jacket, no trousers, nothing on but a coarse towel linen shirt reaching only to my knees. I had no bed. I must have perished with cold, but that the coldest nights 
I used to steal a bag which was used for carrying corn to the mill. I would crawl into this bag and there sleep on the cold, damp clay floor with my head in and feet out. My feet have been so cracked with the frost that the pen with which I'm writing might be laid in the gashes. We were not regularly allowanced. Our food was coarse cornmeal boiled. This was called mush. It was put into a large wooden tray or trough and set down upon the ground. The children were then called like so many pigs and like so many pigs, they would come and devour the mush. Some with oyster shells, others with pieces of shingle, some with naked hands and none with spoons. He that ate fastest got most. He that was strongest secured the best place and few left the trough satisfied. I was probably between seven and eight years old when I left Colonel Lloyd's plantation. I left it with joy. I shall never forget the ecstasy with which I received the intelligence that my old master, Anthony, had determined to let me go to Baltimore to live with Mr. Hugh Old, brother to my old master's son-in-law, Captain Thomas Old. I received this information about three days before my departure. They were three of the happiest days I ever enjoyed. I spent the most part of all these three days in the creek, washing off the plantation scurf and preparing myself for my departure. The pride of appearance, which this would indicate was not my own. I spent the time in washing, not so much because I wished to, but because Mrs. Lucretia had told me I must get all the dead skin off my feet and knees before I could go to Baltimore. The people in Baltimore were very cleanly and would laugh at me if I looked dirty. Besides, she was going to give me a pair of trousers, which I should not put on unless I got all the dirt off me. The thought of owning a pair of trousers was great indeed. It was almost a sufficient motive, not only, not only to make me take off what would be called by pig drovers the mange, but the skin itself. I went at it in good earnest, working for the first time with the hope of reward. The ties that ordinarily bind children to their homes were all suspended in my case. I found no severe trial in my departure. My home was charmless. It was not home to me. On parting from it, I could not feel that I was leaving anything which I could have enjoyed by staying. My mother was dead. My grandmother lived far off so that I seldom saw her. I had two sisters and one brother that lived in the same house with me. But the early separation of us from our mother had well nigh blotted the fact of our relationship from our memories. I looked for home elsewhere and was confident of finding none which I should relish less than the one which I was leaving. If, however, I found in my new home hardship, hunger, whipping, and nakedness, I had the consolation that I should not have escaped any one of them by staying. Having already had more than a taste of them in the house of my old master, and having endured them there, I very naturally inferred my, my ability to endure them elsewhere, and especially at Baltimore, but I, for I had something of the feeling about Baltimore that is ex expressed in the proverb that being hanged in England is preferable to dying a natural death in Ireland. I had the strongest desire to see Baltimore. Cousin Tom, though not fluent in speech, had inspired me with that desire by his eloquent description of the place. I could never point out anything at the great house, no matter how beautiful or powerful, but that he had seen something at Baltimore far exceeding, both in beauty and strength, the object which I pointed out to him. Even the great house itself, with all its pictures, was far inferior to many buildings in Baltimore. So strong was my desire that I thought a gratification of it would fully compensate for whatever loss of comforts I should sustain by the exchange. I left without a regret and with the highest hopes of future happiness. We sailed out of Miles River for Baltimore 
on a Saturday morning. I remember only the day of the week, for at that time I had no knowledge of the days of the month, nor the months of the year. On setting sail, I walked aft and gave to Colonel, Colonel Lloyd's plantation what I hoped would be the last look. I then placed myself in the bows of the sloop and there spent the remainder of the day in looking ahead, interesting myself in what was in the distance rather than in things nearby or behind. In the afternoon of that day, we reached Annapolis, the capital of the state. We stopped but a few moments so that I had no time to go on shore. It was the first large town that I had ever seen. And though, and though it would look small compared with some of our New England factory villages, I thought it was a wonderful place for its size, more imposing even than the Great House Farm. We arrived at Baltimore early on Sunday morning, landing at Smith's Wharf, not far, not far from Bowley's Wharf. We had on board the sloop a large flock of sheep, and after aiding in driving them to the slaughterhouse of Mr. Curtis on Loudon Slater's Hill, I was conducted by Rich, one of the hands belonging on board the sloop, to my new home in Aliciana Street, near Mr. Gardner's shipyard on Fells Point. Mr. and Mrs. Ald were both at home and met me at the door with their little son, Thomas, to take care, to take care of whom I had been given. And here I saw what I had never seen before. It was a white face beaming with the most kindly emotions. It was the face of my new mistress, Sophia Ald. I wish I could describe the rapture that flashed through my soul as I beheld it. It was a new and strange sight to me, brightening up my pathway with the light of happiness. Little Thomas was told, there was his Freddy, and I was told to take care of little Thomas. And thus I entered upon the duties of my new home with the most cheering prospect ahead. I look upon my departure from Colonel Lloyd's plantation as one of the most interesting events of my life. It is possible and even quite probable that but for the mere circumstance of being removed from that plantation to Baltimore, I should have today instead of being here seated by my own table in the enjoyment of freedom and happiness of home, writing this narrative, been confined in the galling chains of slavery. Going to live at Baltimore laid the foundation and opened the gateway to all my subsequent prosperity. I have ever regarded it as the first plain manifestation of that kind of providence which has ever since attended me and marked my life with so many favors. I regarded the selection of myself as being somewhat remarkable. There were a number of slave children that might have been sent from the plantation to Baltimore. There were those younger, those older, and those of the same age. I was chosen from among them all and was the first, last, and only choice. I may be deemed superstitious and even egotistical in regarding this event as a special interposition of divine providence in my favor, but I should be false to the earliest sentiments of my soul if I suppress the opinion. I prefer to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others, rather than to be false and incur my own abhorrence. From my earliest recollection, I date the entertainment of a deep conviction that slavery would not always be able to hold me within its foul embrace. And in the darkest hours of my career in slavery, this living word of faith and spirit of hope departed not from me, but remained like ministering angels to cheer me through the gloom. This good spirit was from God, and to him I offer thanksgiving and praise. Chapter six. My new mistress proved to be all she appeared when I first met her at the door, a woman of the kindest heart and finest feelings. She had never had a slave under her control previously to myself, and prior to her marriage, she had been dependent upon her own industry for a living. 
She was by trade a weaver, and by constant application to her business, she had been in a good degree preserved from the blighting and dehumanizing effects of slavery. I was utterly astonished at her goodness. I scarcely knew how to behave towards her. She was entirely unlike any other white woman I had ever seen. I could not approach her as I was accustomed to approaching other white ladies. My early instruction was all out of place. The crouching servility, usually so acceptable quality in a slave, did not answer when manifested towards her. Her favor was not gained by it. She seemed to be disturbed by it. She did not deem it impudent or unmannerable for a slave to look at her in the face. The meanest slave was put fully at ease in her presence and none left without feeling better for having seen her. Her face was made of heavenly smiles and her voice of tranquil music. But, alas, this kind heart had but a short time to remain such. The fatal poison of irresponsible power was already in her hands and soon commenced its infernal work. That cheerful eye under the influence of slavery soon became red with anger. That voice made all of sweet accord changed to one of harsh and horror discord. And that angelic face gave place to that of a demon. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Ald, she very kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. After I'd learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point of my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his words, further, he said, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an eel. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that nigger, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation, explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement and, it prized, and I prized it highly. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted and I got it at a time when I, was, when I least expected it. Whilst I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my mistress, I was gladdened by the invaluable instruction which, by the merest accident, I had gained from my master. Though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with high hope and fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn how to read. That very decided manner with which he spoke and strove to impress his wife with the evil consequences of giving me instruction, served to convince me that he was deeply sensible of the truths he was uttering. It gave me the best assurance that I might rely with the utmost confidence on the results which, he said, would flow from teaching me to read. What he most dreaded, that I most desired. What he most loved, that I most hated. That which to him was a great evil, to be carefully shunned was to me a great good, to be diligently sought. And the argument which he so warmly urged against my learning to read only served to inspire me with the desire and determination to learn. In learning to read, I owe almost as much to the bitter opposition of my master 
as to the kindly aid of my mistress. I acknowledged the benefit of both. I had resided but a short time in Baltimore before I observed a marked difference in the treatment of slaves from that which I had witnessed in the country. A city slave is almost a free man compared with the slave on the plantation. He is much better fed and clothed and enjoys privileges altogether unknown to the slave on the plantation. There is a vestige of decency, a sense of shame, that does much to curb and check those outbreaks of atrocious cruelty so commonly enacted upon the plantation. He is a desperate slaveholder who will shock the humanity of his non-slaveholding neighbors with the cries of his lacerated slave. Few are willing to incur the odium attaching to the reputation of being a cruel master. And above all things, they would not be known as not giving a slave enough to eat. Every city slaveholder is anxious to have it known of him that he feeds his slaves well, and it is due to them to say that most of them do give their slaves enough to eat. There are, however, some painful exceptions to this rule. Directly opposite to us, on Philpot Street, live Mr. Thomas Hamilton. He owned two slaves. Their names were Henrietta and Mary. Henrietta was about 22 years old, Mary was about 14, and of all the mangled and emaciated creatures I ever looked upon, these two were the most so. His heart must be harder than stone that could look upon these unmoved. The head, neck, and shoulders of Mary were literally cut to pieces. I frequently felt her head and found it nearly covered with festering sores caused by the lash of her cruel mistress. I do not know that her master ever whipped her, but I have been eyewitness to the cruelty of Mrs. Hamilton. I used to be in Mr. Hamilton's house nearly every day. Mrs. Hamilton used to sit in a large chair in the middle of the room with a heavy cowskin always by her side and scarce an hour passed during the day but was marked by the blood of one of these slaves. The girl seldom passed her without her saying, move faster, you black git. At the same time, giving them a blow with the cowskin over the head or shoulders, often drawing the blood. She would then say, take that, you black git. Continuing, if you don't move faster, I'll move you added to the cruel lashings to which these slaves were subjected, they were kept nearly half starved. They seldom knew what it was to eat a full meal. I have seen Mary contending with the pigs for offal thrown into the street. So much was Mary kicked and cut to pieces that she was oftener called pet than her name. Chapter seven, I lived in Master Hugh's family for about seven years. During this time, I succeeded in learning to read and write. In accomplishing this, I was compelled to resort to various stratagems. I had no regular teacher. My mistress, who had kindly commenced to instruct me, had, in compliance with the advice and direction of her husband, not only ceased to instruct, but had set her face against my being instructed by anyone else. It is due, however, to my mistress to say of her that she did not adopt this course of treatment immediately. She at first lacked the depravity indispensable to shutting me up in mental darkness. It was at least necessary for her to have some training in the exercise of irresponsible power to make her equal to the task of treating me as though I were a brute. My mistress was, as I have said, a kind and tender-hearted woman. And in the simplicity of her soul, she commenced, when I first went to live with her, to treat me as she supposed one human being ought to treat another. In entering upon the duties of a slaveholder, she did not seem to perceive that I sustained to her the relation of a mere chattel, and that for her to treat me as a human being was not only wrong, but dangerously so. Slavery proved as injurious to her as it did to me. 
When I went there, she was a pious, warm, and tender-hearted woman. There was no sorrow or suffering for which she had not a tear. She had bread for the hungry, clothes for the naked, and comfort for every mourner that came within her reach. Slavery soon proved its ability to divest her of these heavenly qualities. Under its influence, the tender heart became stone, and the lamb-like disposition gave way to one of tiger-like fierceness. The first step in her downward course was in her ceasing to instruct me. She now commenced to practice her husband's precepts. She finally became even more violent in her opposition than her husband himself. She was not satisfied with simply doing as well as he had commanded. She seemed anxious to do better. Nothing seemed to make her more angry than to see me with a newspaper. She seemed to think that here lay the danger. I have had her rush at me with a face made all up of fury and snatched from me a newspaper in a manner that fully revealed her apprehension. She was an apt woman and a little experience soon demonstrated to her satisfaction that education and slavery were incompatible with each other. From this time, I was most narrowly watched. If I was in a separate room any considerable length of time, I was sure to be suspected of having a book and was at once called to give an account of myself. All this, however, was too late. The first step had been taken. Mistress, in teaching me the alphabet, had given me the inch, and no precaution could prevent me from taking the L. The plan which I adopted and the one by which I was most successful was that of making friends of all the little white boys whom I met in the street. As many of these as I could, I converted into teachers. With their kindly aid, obtained at different times and in different places, I finally succeeded in learning to read. When I was sent of errands, I always took my book with me. And by going one part of my errand quickly, I found time to get a lesson before my return. I used also to carry bread with me, enough of which was always in the house and to which I was always welcome. For I was much better off in this regard than many of the poor white children in our neighborhood. This bread I used to bestow upon the hungry little urchins who in return would give me that more valuable bread of knowledge. And I am strongly tempted to give the names of two or three of those little boys as a testimonial of the gratitude and affection I bear them. But prudence forbids. Not that it would injure me, but it might embarrass them. For it is almost an unpardonable offense to teach slaves to read in this Christian country. It is enough to say of the dear little fellows that they lived on Philpot Street very near Durgan and Bailey Shipyard. I used to talk this matter of slavery over with them. I would sometimes say to them, I wished I could be as free as they would be when they got to be men. You will be free as soon as you are 21, but I am a slave for life. Have not I as good a right to be free as you? These words used to trouble them. They would express for me the liveliest sympathy and console me with the hope that something would occur by which I might be free. I was now about 12 years old, and the thought of being a slave for life began to bear heavily upon my heart. Just about this time, I got hold of a book entitled The Columbian Order. Every opportunity I got, I used to read this book. Among much of other interesting matter, I found in it a dialogue between a master and a slave. The slave was represented as having run away from his master three times. The dialogue represented the conversation which took place between them when the slave was retaken the third time. In this dialogue, the whole argument in behalf of slavery was brought forward by the master, all of which was disposed of by the slave. The slave was made to say some very smart as well as impressive things in reply to his master things which had the desired though unexpected effect, for the conversation resulted in the voluntary emancipation of the slave on the part of the master.
In the same book, I met with one of Sheridan's mighty speeches on and in behalf of Catholic emancipation. These were choice documents to me. I read them over and over again with unabated interest. They gave tongue to interesting thoughts of my own soul, which had frequently flashed through my mind and died away for want of utterance. The moral which I gained from the dialogue was the power of truth over the conscience of even a slaveholder. What I got from Sheridan was a bold denunciation of slavery and a powerful vindication of human rights. The reading of these documents enabled me to utter my thoughts and to meet the arguments brought forward to sustain slavery. But while they were relieved, but while they relieved me of one difficulty, they brought on another even more painful than the one of which I was relieved. The more I read, the more I was led to abhor and to detest my enslavers. I could regard them in no other light than a band of successful robbers who had left their homes and gone to Africa and stolen us from our homes and in a strange land reduced us to slavery. I loathed them as being the meanest as well as the most wicked of men. As I read and contemplated the subject, behold, that very discontentment which Master Hugh had predicted would follow my learning to read had already come to torment and sting my soul to unutterable anguish. As I writhed under it, I would at times feel that learning to read had been a curse rather than a blessing. It had given me a view of my wretched condition without the remedy. It opened my eyes to the horrible pit, but to no ladder upon which to get out. In moments of agony, I envied my fellow slaves for their stupidity. I have often wished myself a beast. I preferred the condition of the meanest reptile to my own. Anything, no matter what, to get rid of thinking. It was this everlasting thinking of my condition that tormented me. There was no getting rid of it. It was pressed upon me by every object within sight or hearing, animate or inanimate. The silver trump of freedom had roused my soul to eternal wakefulness. Freedom now appeared to disappear no more forever. It was heard in every sound and seen in everything. It was ever present to torment me with a sense of my wretched condition. I saw nothing without seeing it. I heard nothing without hearing it and felt nothing without feeling it. It looked from every star, it smiled in every calm, breathed in every wind and moved in every storm. I often found myself regretting my own existence and wishing myself dead but for the hope of being free. I have no doubt but that I should have killed myself or done something for which I should have been killed. While in this state of mind, I was eager to hear anyone speak of slavery. I was a ready listener. Every little while I could hear something about the abolitionists. It was some time before I found what the word meant. It was always used in such connections as to make it an interesting word to me. If a slave ran away and succeeded in getting clear, or if a slave killed his master, set fire to a barn, or did anything very wrong in the mind of a slaveholder, it was spoken of as the fruit of abolition. Hearing the word in this connection very often, I set about learning what it meant. The dictionary afforded me little or no help. I found it was the act of abolishing, but then I, I did not know what was to be abolished. Here I was perplexed. I did not dare to ask anyone about its meaning, for I was satisfied that it was something they wanted me to know very little about. After a patient waiting, I got one of our city newspapers containing an account of the number of petitions from the North, praying for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia and of the slave trade between the states. From this time, I understood the words abolition and abolitionist and always drew near when that word was spoken, expecting to hear something of importance to myself and fellow slaves. The light broke in upon me by degrees. I went one day on the wharf of Mr. Waters and seeing two Irishmen unloading a scow of stone, I went unasked 
and help them. When we had finished, one of them came to me and asked me if I were a slave. I told him I was. He asked, are ye a slave for life? I told him that I was. The good, the good Irishman seemed to be deeply affected by the statement. He said to the other that it was a pity so fine a little fellow as myself should be a slave for life. He said it was a shame to hold me. They both advised me to run away to the north, that I should find friends there and that I should be free. I pretended not to be interested in what they said and treated them as if I did not understand them, for I feared they might be treacherous. White men have been known to encourage slaves to escape and then to get the reward, catch them and return them to their masters. I was afraid that these seemingly good men might use me so, but I nevertheless remembered their advice and from that time I resolved to run away. I looked forward to a time at which it would be safe for me to escape. I was too young to think of doing so immediately. Besides, I wished to learn how to write as I might have occasion to write my own past. I consoled myself with the hope that I should one day find a good chance. Meanwhile, I would learn to write. The, the idea as to how I might learn to write was suggested to me by being in Durgan and Bailey shipyard and frequently seeing the ship carpenters after hewing and getting a piece of timber ready for use, write on the timber the name of that part of the ship for which it was intended. When a piece of timber was intended for the larboard side, it would be marked thus, L. When the piece was for the starboard side, it would be marked thus, S. A piece for the larboard side forward would be marked thus, L, F. When a piece was for starboard side forward, it would be marked thus, S, F. For larboard aft, it would be marked thus, L, A. For starboard aft, it would be marked thus, S-A. I soon learned the names of these letters and for what they were intended when placed upon a piece of timber in the shipyard. I immediately commenced copying them and in a short time was able to make the four letters named. After that, when I met with any boy who I knew could write, I would tell him I could write as well as he. The next word would be, I don't believe you, let me see you try it. I would then make the letters which I had been so fortunate as to learn and ask him to beat that. In this way, I got a good many lessons in writing, which it is quite possible I should never have gotten in any other way. During this time, my copy book was the board fence, brick wall and pavement. My pen and ink was a lump of chalk. With these, I learned mainly how to write. I then commenced and continued copying the italics in Webster's spelling book until I could make them all without looking on the book. By this time, my little master Thomas had gone to school and learned how to write and had written over a number of copy books. These had been brought home and shown to some of our, our near neighbors and then laid aside. My mistress used to go to class meeting at the Wilk Street Meeting House every Monday afternoon and leave me to take care of the house. When, thus, when left thus, I used to spend the time in writing in the spaces left in Master Thomas's copy book, copying what he had written. I continued to do this until I could write a hand very similar to that of Master Thomas. Thus, after a long, tedious effort for years, I finally succeeded in learning how to write. Chapter eight. In a very short time after I went to live at Baltimore, my old master's youngest son, Richard, died. And then about three years and six months after his death, my old master, Captain Anthony, died, leaving only his son, Andrew, and daughter, Lucretia, to share his estate. He died while on a visit to see his daughter in Hillsborough. Cut off thus unexpectedly, he left no will as to the disposal of his property. Of the, he left no will as to the disposal of his property. It was therefore necessary to have a valuation of the property that it might be equally divided between Mrs. Lucretia and Master Andrew. 
I was immediately sent for to be valued with the other property. Here again, my feelings rose up in detestation of slavery. I had now a new conception of my degraded condition. Prior to this, I had become, if not insensible to my lot, at least partly so. I left Baltimore with a young heart overborne with sadness and a soul full of apprehension. I took passage with Captain Rowe in the schooner Wildcat, and after a sail of about 24 hours, I found myself near the place of my birth. I had now been absent from it almost, if not quite, five years. I, however, remember the place very well. I was only about five years old when I left it to go and live with my old master on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, so that I was now between 10 and 11 years old. We were all ranked together at the valuation. Men and women, old and young, married and singled, were ranked with horses, sheep, and swine. There were horses and men and cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same, same rank in the scale of being, and were all subjected to the same narrow examination. Silvery-headed age and sprightly youth, maids and matrons, had to undergo the same indelicate inspection. At this moment, I saw more clearly than ever the brutalizing effects of slavery upon both slave and slaveholder. After the valuation, then came the division. I have no language to express the high excitement and deep anxiety which were felt among us poor slaves during this time. Our fate for life was now to be decided. We had no more voice in that decision than the brutes among whom we were ranked. A single word from the white men was enough against all our wishes, prayers, and entreaties to sunder forever the dearest friends, dearest kindred, and strongest ties known to human beings. In addition to the pain of separation, there was the horrid dread of falling into the hands of Master Andrew. He was known to us all as being the most cruel wretch, a common drunkard who had by his reckless mismanagement and profligate dissipation already wasted a large portion of his father's property. We all felt that we might as well be sold at once to the Georgia traders as to pass into his hands, for we knew that would be our inevitable condition, a condition held by us all in the utmost horror and dread. I suffered more anxiety than most of my fellow slaves. I had known what it was to be kindly treated. They had known nothing of the kind. They had seen little or nothing of the world. They were in very deed men and women of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Their backs had been made familiar with a bloody lash so that they had become callous. Mine was yet tender for while at Baltimore, I got few whippings and few slaves could boast of a kinder master and mistress than myself. And the thought of passing out of their hands into those of Master Andrew, a man who but a few days before to give me a sample of his bloody disposition, took my little brother by the throat, threw him on the ground, and with the heel of his boot stamped upon his head till the blood gushed from his nose and ears was well calculated to make me anxious as to my fate. After he had committed this savage outrage upon my brother, he turned to me and said, that was the way he meant to serve me one of these days, meaning, I suppose, when I came into his possession. Thanks to a kind providence, I fell to the portion of Mrs. Lucretia and was sent immediately back to Baltimore to live again in the family of Master Hugh. Their joy at my return equaled their sorrow at my departure. It was a glad day to me. I had escaped a worse than lion's jaws. I was absent from Baltimore for the purpose of valuation and division, just about one month, and it seemed to have been six. 
Very soon after my return to Baltimore, my mistress, Lucretia, died, leaving her husband and one child, Amanda. And in a very short time after her death, Master Andrew died. Now all the property of my old master, slaves included, was in the hands of strangers, strangers who had had nothing to do with accumulating it. Not a slave was left free. All remained slaves from the youngest to the oldest. If any one thing in my experience, more than another, served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery and to fill me with unutterable loathing of slaveholders, it was their base ingratitude to my poor old grandmother. She had served my master faithfully from youth to old age. She had been the source of all his wealth. She had peopled his plantation with slaves. She had become a great grandmother in his service. She had rocked him in, inf in infancy, attended him in childhood, served him through life, and at his death, wiped from his icy brow the cold death sweat and closed his eyes forever. She was nevertheless left a slave, a slave for life, a slave in the hands of strangers. And in their hands, she saw her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren divided like so many sheep without being gratified with the small privilege of a single word as to their or her own destiny. And to cap the climax of their base ingratitude and fiendish barbarity, my grandmother, who was now very old, had outlived my old master and all his children, having seen the beginning and end of all of them, and her present owners finding she was but little value, her frame already racked with the pains of old age and complete helplessness, fast stealing over her once active limbs. They took her to the woods, built her a little hut, put up a little mud chimney, and then made her welcome to the privilege of supporting herself there in perfect loneliness, thus virtually turning her out to die. If my poor old grandmother now lives, she lives to suffer in utter loneliness. She lives to remember and mourn over the loss of children, the loss of grandchildren, the loss of great grandchildren. They are, in the language of the slave's poet, Whittier, gone, gone, sold and gone to the rice swamp, dank and lone, where the slave whip ceaseless swings, where the noisome insect stings where the fever demon strews, poison with the fall falling dews, where the sickly sunbeams glare through the hot and misty air, gone, gone, sold and gone, to the rice swamp, dank and lone, from Virginia hills and waters, woe is me, my stolen daughters. The heart is desolate, the children, the unconscious children who once sang and danced in her presence are gone. She gropes her way in the darkness of age for a drink of water. Instead of the voices of her children, she hears by day the moans of the dove and by night the screams of the hideous owl. All is gloom, the grave is at the door. And now when weighed down by the pains and aches of old age, when the head inclines to the feet, when the beginning and ending of human existence meet, and helpless infancy and painful old age combine together, at this time, this most needful time, the time for exercise of that tenderness and affection, which children only can exercise toward a towards a declining parent. My poor old grandmother, the devoted mother of 12 children, is left all alone in yonder little hut before a few dim embers. She stands, she sits, she staggers, she falls, she groans, she dies. And there are none of her children or grandchildren present to wipe from her wrinkled brow the cold sweat of death or to place beneath the sod her falling remains. Will not a righteous God visit for these things. In about two years after the death of Mrs. Lucretia, Master Thomas married his second wife, 
Her name was Rowena Hamilton. She was the eldest daughter of Mr. William Hamilton. Master now lived in St. Michael's. Not long after his marriage, a misunderstanding took place between himself and Master Hugh. And as a means of punishing his brother, he took me from him to live with himself at St. Michael's. Here I underwent another painful separation. It, however, was not so severe as the one I dreaded at the division of property. For during this interval, a great change had taken place in Master Hugh and his once kind and affectionate wife. The influence of brandy upon them and of slavery upon her had affected a disastrous change in the characters of both. So that as far as they were concerned, I thought I had little to lose by the change. But it was not to them that I was attached. It was to those little Baltimore boys that I felt the strongest attachment. I had received many good lessons from them and was still receiving them. And the thought of leaving them was painful indeed. I was leaving too without the hope of ever being allowed to return. Master Thomas had said he would never let me return again. The barrier betwixt himself and brother he considered impassable. I then had to regret that I did not at least make the attempt to carry out my resolution to run away. But the chances of success are tenfold greater from a city than from the country. I sailed from Baltimore for St. Michael's in the sloop Amanda, Captain Edward Dodson. On my passage, I paid particular attention to the direction which the steamboats took to go to Philadelphia. I found instead of going down, on reaching North Point, they went up the bay in a northeasterly direction. I deemed this knowledge of the utmost importance. My determination to run away was again revived. I resolved to wait only so long as the offering of a favorable opportunity. When that came, I was determined to be off. Chapter nine. I have now reached a period of my life when I could give dates. I left Baltimore and went to live with Master Thomas Auld at St. Michael's in March, 1832. It was now more than seven years since I lived with him in the family of my old master on Colonel Lloyd's plantation. We, of course, were now almost entire strangers to each other. He was to me a new master and I to him a new slave. I was ignorant of his temper and disposition. He was equally so of mine. A very short time, however, brought us into full acquaintance with each other. I was made acquainted with his wife, not less than himself. They were well matched, being equally mean and cruel. I was now, for the first time during a space of more than seven years, made to feel the painful gnawings of hunger, a something which I had not experienced before since I left Colonel Lloyd's plantation. It went hard enough with me then when I could look back to no period in which I had enjoyed a sufficiency. It was tenfold harder after living in Master Hugh's family, where I had always had enough to eat of, and of that which was good. I have said Master Thomas was a mean man. He was so. Not to give a slave enough to eat is regarded as the most aggravated development of meanness even among slaveholders. The rule is, no matter how coarse the food, only let there be enough of it. This is a theory, and in part of Maryland from which I came, it is the general practice. Though there are many exceptions, Master Thomas gave us enough of neither coarse nor fine food. There were four slaves of us in the kitchen, my sister Eliza, my aunt Priscilla, Henny, and myself. And we were allowed less than half a bushel of cornmeal per week and very little else, either in the shape of meat or vegetables. It was not enough for us to subsist upon. We were therefore reduced to the wretched necessity of living at the expense of our neighbors. This we did by begging and stealing, whichever came handy in the time of need the one being considered as legitimate as the other. A great many times have we poor creatures been nearly perishing with hunger when food in abundance lay moldering in the safe and smokehouse and our pious mistress was aware of the fact. And yet that mistress and her husband would kneel every morning and pray that God would bless them in basket and store. Bad as all slaveholders are, we seldom meet one destitute of every element of character commanding respect. My master was one of this rare sort. I do not know of one single noble act ever performed by him. The leading trait in his character was meanness, 
and if there was any other element in his nature, it was made subject to this. He was mean and like most other mean men, he lacked the ability to conceal his meanness. Captain Ald was not born a slaveholder. He had been a poor man, master only of a bay craft. He came into possession of all his slaves by marriage, and of all men, adopted slaveholders are the worst. He was cruel but cowardly. He commanded without firmness. In the enforcement of his rules, he was at times rigid and at times lax. At times, he spoke to his slaves with the firmness of Napoleon and the fury of a demon. At other times, he might well be mistaken for an inquirer who had lost his way. He did nothing of himself. He might have passed for a lion, but for his ears. In all things noble which he attempted, his own meanness shone most conspicuous. His heirs' words and actions were the heirs' words and actions of born slaveholders, and being assumed were awkward enough. He was not even a good imitator. He possessed all the disposition to deceive, but wanted the power. Having no resources within himself, he was compelled to be the copyist of men. And being such, he was forever the victim of inconsistency. He was forever the victim of inconsistency and of consequence, he was an object of contempt and was held as such even by his slaves. The luxury of having slaves of his own to wait upon him was something new and unprepared for. He was a slaveholder without the ability to hold slaves. He found himself incapable of managing his slaves either by force, fear, or fraud. We seldom called him master. We generally called him Captain Old and were hardly disposed to title him at all. I doubt not that our conduct had much to do with making him appear awkward and of consequence fretful. Our want of reverence for him must have perplexed him greatly. He wished to have us call him master, but lacked the firmness necessary to command us to do so. His wife used to insist upon our calling him so, but to no purpose. In August 19, 1832, my master attended a Methodist camp meeting held in the Bayside Talbot County and there experienced religion. I indulged a faint hope that his conversion would lead him to emancipate his slaves and that if he did not do this, it would at any rate make him more kind and humane. I was disappointed in both these respects. It neither made him to be humane to his slaves nor to emancipate them. If it had any effect on his character, it made him more cruel and hateful in all his ways. For I believe him to have been a much worse man after his conversion than before. Prior to his conversion, he relied upon his own depravity to shield and sustain him in a savage barbarity. But after his conversion, he found religious sanction and support for his slaveholding cruelty. He made the greatest pretensions to piety. His house was the house of prayer. He prayed morning, noon, and night. He very soon distinguished himself among his brethren and was soon made a great class leader and exhorter. His activity in revivals was great, and he proved himself an instrument in the hands of the church and converted many souls. His house was the preacher's home. They used to take great pleasure in coming there to put up. But while he starved us, he stuffed them. We have had three or four preachers there at a time. The names of those who used to come most frequently, most frequently while I lived there were Mr. Storks, Mr. Urey, Mr. Humphrey, and Mr. Hickey. I have also seen Mr. George Cookman at our house. We slaves loved Mr. Cookman. We believed him to be a good man. We thought him instrumental in getting Mr. Samuel Harrison, a very rich slaveholder to emancipate his slaves, and by some means got the impression that he was laboring to effect the emancipation of all the slaves. While he was at our house, we were sure to be called into prayers. When the others were there, we were sometimes called in and sometimes not. Mr. Cookman took more notice of us than either of the other ministers. He could not come among us without, bringing his, without betraying his sympathy for us, and stupid as we were, we had the sagacity to see. While I lived with my master in St. Michael's, there was a white young man, a Mr. Wilson, who proposed to keep a Sabbath school for the instruction of such, of such slaves as might be disposed to learn to read the New Testament. We met but three times when Mr. West and Mr. Fairbanks, both class leaders with many others, came upon us with sticks and other missiles, drove us off, and forbade us to meet again. Thus ended our little Sabbath school in the pious town of St. Michael's. I have said my master found religious sanction for his cruelty. As an example, I will state one of the many facts going to prove the charge. I have seen him tie up a lame young woman and whip her with a heavy cow skin upon her naked shoulders, causing the warm red blood to drip, and in justification of the bloody deed, he would quote this passage of scripture. He that knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. Master would keep this lacerated young woman tied up in this hard situation four or five hours at a time. I have known him to tie her up early in the morning to whip her before breakfast, leave her, go to his store, return at dinner, and whip her again. 
cutting her in places already made raw with his cruel lash. The secret of master's cruelty toward Henny is found in the fact of her being helpless. When quite a child, she fell into the fire and burned herself horribly. Her hands were so burned she never got the use of them. She could do very little but bear heavy burdens. She was to master a bill of expense, and as he was a mean man, she was a constant offense to him. He seemed desirous of getting the poor girl out of existence. He gave her away once to his sister, but being a poor gift, she was not disposed to keep her. Finally, my benevolent master, to use his own words, set her adrift to take care of herself. Here was a recently converted man holding on upon the mother and at the same time turning out her helpless child to starve and die. Master Thomas is one of the many pious slaveholders who hold slaves for the very, very charitable purpose of taking care of them. My master and myself had quite a number of differences. He found me unsuitable to his purpose. My city life, he said, had had a very pernicious effect upon me. It almost ruined me for every good purpose and fitted me for everything which was bad. One of my greatest faults was that of letting his horse run away and go down to his father-in-law's farm, which was about five miles from St. Michael's. I would then have to go after them. My reason for this kind of carelessness or carefulness was that I could always get something to eat when I went there. Master William Hamilton, my fa master's father-in-law, always gave his slaves enough to eat. I never left there hungry, no matter how great the need of my speedy return. Master Thomas at length said he would stand it no longer. I had lived with him nine months, during which time he had given me a number of severe whippings, all to no good purpose. He resolved to put me out, as he said, to be broken. For this year, for, for this purpose, he let me for one year to a man named Edward Covey. Mr. Covey was a poor man, a farm renter. He rented the place upon which he lived, as also the hands with which he took. Mr. Covey had acquired a very high reputation for breaking young slaves, and this reputation was of immense value to him. It enabled to him to get his farm tilled with much less expense than himself than he could have done without such a reputation. Some slaveholders thought it not much to allow Mr. Covey to have their slaves one year for the sake of the training to which they were subjected without any other compensation. He could hire young help with great ease in consequence of his reputation. Added to the natural good qualities of Mr. Covey, he was a professor of religion, a pious soul, a member in a class in the Methodist church. All of this added weight to his reputation as a nigger breaker. I was aware of all the facts, having been made acquainted with them by a young man who had lived there. I nevertheless made the change gladly, for I was sure of getting enough to eat, which is not the smallest consideration to a hungry man. I left Master Thomas's house and went to live with Mr. Covey on the 1st of January, 1833. I was now, for the first time in my life, a field hand. In my new employment, I found myself even more awkward than a country boy appeared to be in a large city. I had been at my new home, but one week before Mr. Covey gave me a very severe whipping, cutting my back, causing the blood to run, and raising ridges on my flesh as large as my little finger. The details of this affair are as follows. Mr. Covey sent me very early in the morning of one of our coldest days in the month of January to the woods to get a load of wood. He gave me a team of unbroken oxen. He told me which was the in-hand ox and which was the off-hand one. He told me he then tried, he then tied the end of a large rope around the horns of the in-hand ox. He gave the other end of it and told me if the oxen started to run, that I must hold upon the rope. I had never driven oxen before, and of course, I was very awkward. I, however, succeeded in getting to the edge of the woods with little difficulty, but I had got very few rods into the woods when the oxen took fright and started full tilt, carrying the cart against trees and over stumps in the most frightful manner. I expected every moment that my brains would be, bashed, would be dashed out against the trees. After running thus a considerable distance, they finally upset the cart, dashing it with great force against a tree and threw themselves into a dense thicket. How I escaped death, I do not know. There I was, entirely alone, in a thick wood, in a place new to me, my cart was upset and shattered 
my oxen were entangled among the young trees, and there was none to help me. After a long spell of effort, I succeeded in getting my cart righted, my oxen disentangled, and again yoked to the cart. I now proceeded with my team to the place where I had, the day before, been chopping wood and loaded my cart pretty heavily, thinking in this way to tame my oxen. I then proceeded on my way home. I had now consumed one half of the day. I got out of the wood safely and now felt out of danger. I stopped my oxen to open the wood's gate. And just as I did so, before I could get hold of my ox rope, the oxen again started rushing through the gate, catching it between the wheel and the body of the cart, tearing it into pieces and coming within a few inches of crushing me against the gatepost. Thus twice in one short day, I escaped death by the merest chance. On my return, I told Mr. Covey what had happened and how it happened. He ordered me to return to the woods again immediately. I did so and he followed on after me. Just as I caught into the woods, he came up and told me to stop my cart and that he would teach me how to trifle away my time and break gates. He then went to a large gum tree and with his ax cut three large switches. And after trimming them up neatly with his pocket knife, he ordered me to take off my clothes. I made him no answer, nor did I strip myself. Upon this, he rushed at me with the fierceness of a tiger, tore off my clothes and lashed me till he had worn out his switches, cutting me so savagely as to leave the marks visible for a long time after. This whipping was the first of a number just like it and for similar offenses. I lived with Mr. Covey one year. During the first six months of that year, scarce a week passed without his whipping me. I was seldom free from a sore back. My awkwardness was almost always his excuse for whipping me. We were worked fully up to the point of endurance. Long before day we were up, our horses fed, and by the first approach of day, we were off to the field with our hoes and plowing team. Mr. Cuppy gave us enough to eat, but scarce time to eat it. We were often less than five minutes taking our meals. We were often in the fields from the first approach of day till its last lingering ray had left us. And at saving fodder time, midnight often caught us in the field binding blades. Cubby would be out with us. The way he used to stand it was this. He would come spend the most of his afternoons in bed. He would then come out fresh in the evening, ready to urge us on with his words, example, and frequently the whip. Mr. Covey was one of the few slaveholders who could and did work with his hands. He was a hardworking man. He knew by himself just what a man or boy could do. There was no deceiving him. His work went on in his absence almost as well as in his presence. And he had the faculty of making us feel that he was ever present with us. This he did by surprising us. He seldom approached the spot where we were at work openly, if he could do it secretly. He always aimed at taking us by surprise. Such was his cunning that we used to call him among ourselves, the snake. When we were at work in the cornfield, he would sometimes crawl on his hands and knees to avoid detection. And all at once he would rise nearly in our midst and scream out, ha ha, come, come, dash on, dash on. This being his mode of attack, it was never safe to stop a single minute. His comings were like a thief in the night. He appeared to us as being ever at hand. He was under every tree, behind every stump, in every bush, and at every window on the plantation. He would sometimes mount his horse as if bound to St. Michael's, a distance of seven miles, and in half an hour afterwards, you would see him coiled up in the corner of the wood fence, watching every motion 
of the slaves. He would, for this purpose, leave his horse tied up in the woods. Again, he would sometimes walk up to us and give us orders as though he was upon the point of starting on a journey, turn his back upon us and make as though he was going to the house to get ready. And before he would get halfway thither, he would turn short and crawl into a fence corner or behind some tree and there watch us till the going down of the sun. Mr. Covey's forte consisted in his power to deceive. His life was devoted to planning and perpetuating the grossest deceptions. Everything he possessed in the shape of learning or religion, he made conform, conform to his disposition to deceive. He seemed to think himself equal to deceiving the Almighty. He would make a short prayer in the morning and a long prayer at night. And, strange as it may seem, few men would at times appear more devotional than he. The exercises of his family devotions were always commenced with singing. And, as he was a very poor singer himself, the duty of raising the hymn generally came upon me. He would read his hymn and nod at me to commence. I would at times do so, at others I would not. My non-compliance would almost always produce much confusion. To show himself independent of me, he would start and stagger through with his hymn in the most discordant manner. In this state of mind, he prayed with more than ordinary spirit. Poor man. Such was his disposition and success at deceiving. I do verily believe that he sometimes deceived himself into the solemn belief that he was a sincere worshiper of the Most High God. And this, too, at a time when he may be said to have been guilty of compelling his woman slave to commit the sin of adultery. The fact in the case are these. Mr. Covey was a poor man. He was just commencing in life. He was only able to buy one slave. And shocking as is the fact, he bought her, as he said, for a breeder. This woman was named Carolyn. Mr. Covey bought her from Mr. Thomas Lowe, about six miles from St. Michael's. She was a large, able-bodied woman, about 20 years old. She had already given birth to one child which proved her to be just what he wanted. After buying her, he hired a married man, the Mr. Samuel Harrison, to live with him one year. In him, he used to fasten up with her every night. The result was that at the end of the year, the miserable woman gave birth to twins. At this result, Mr. Covey seemed to be highly pleased both with the man and the wretched woman. Such was the joy and that of his wife that nothing they could do for Caroline during her confinement was too good or too hard to be done. The children were regarded as being quite in addition to his wealth. If at one time of my life more than another, I was made to drink the bitterest dregs of slavery, that time was during the first six months of my stay with Mr. Covey. We were worked in all weathers. It was never too hot or too cold. It can never rain, blow, hail, or snow too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of night. The longest days were too short for him and the shortest nights too long for him. I was somewhat unimaginable when I first went there but a few months of this discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey succeeded in breaking me. I was broken in body, soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed. My intellect languished. The disposition to read departed. The cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me. And behold, a man transformed into a brute. Sunday was my only leisure time. 
I spent just in a sort of beast-like stupor between sleep and wake under some large tree. At times, I would rise up. A flash of energetic freedom would dart through my soul, accompanied with a faint beam of hope that flickered for a moment and then I sank down again, mourning over my wretched condition. I was sometimes prompted to take my life in that of Covey, but was prevented by a combination of hope and fear. My sufferings on this plantation seem now like a dream rather than a stern reality. Our house stood within a few rods of Chesapeake Bay, whose broad bosom was ever white with sails from every quarter of the habitable globe. Those beautiful vessels, robed in purest white, so delightful to the eye of freemen, were to me so many shrouded ghosts to terrify and torment me with thoughts of my wretched condition. I have often, in the deep stillness of a summer Sabbath, stood all alone upon the lofty banks of that noble bay and traced with saddened heart and tearful eye the countless number of sails off to the migration. The sight of these always affected me powerfully. My thoughts would compel utterance, and there, with no audience but the Almighty, I would pour out my soul's complaint in my rude way with an apostrophe to the moving multitudes of ships. You are loose from your moorings and are free. I am fast in my chains and am a slave. You move merrily before the gentle gale, and I sadly before the bloody whip. You are freedom's swift-winged angels that fly around the world. I am confined in bands of iron. Oh, that I were free. Oh, that I were on one of your gallant decks and under your protecting wing. Alas, betwixt me and you, the turbid waters roil. Go on, go on. Oh, that I could also go. Could I but swim, if I could fly? Oh, why was I born a man of whom to make a brute? The glad ship is gone. She hides in the dim distance. I am left in the hottest hell of unending slavery. Oh God, save me, God, deliver me, let me be free. Is there any God? Why am I a slave? I will run away, I will not stand it, get caught or get clear, I'll try it. I had as well die with Og as the fever. I have only one life to lose. I had as well be killed running as die standing. Only think of it, 100 miles straight north, and I am free. Try it. Yes, God help me, I will. It cannot be that I shall live and die a slave. I will take to the water. This very bay shall yet bear me into freedom. The steamboat steered in a northeast course from North Point. I will do the same. And when I get to the head of the bay, I will turn my canoe adrift and walk straight through Delaware into Pennsylvania. When I get there, I shall not be required to have a pass. I can travel without being disturbed. Let but the first opportunity offer and come what will, I am off. Meanwhile, I will try to bear up under the yoke. I am not the only slave in the world. Why should I fret? I can bear as much as any of them. Besides, I am but a boy and all boys are bound to someone. It may be that my misery and slavery will only increase my happiness when I get free. There is a better day coming. Thus I used to think and thus I used to speak to myself, goaded almost to madness at one moment and at the next reconciling myself. I have already intimated that my condition was much worse during the first six months of my stay in Mr. Covey's than in the last six. The circumstances leading to the change in Mr. Covey's course toward me, 
form an epic in my humble history. You have seen how a man was made a slave. You shall see how a slave was made a man. On one of the hottest days of the month of August, 1833, Bill Smith, William Hughes, a slave named Eli and myself were engaged in fanning wheat. Hughes was clearing the fan wheat from before the fan. Eli was turning, Smith was feeding, and I was carrying wheat to the fan. The work was simple, requiring strength rather than intellect. Yet, to one entirely unused to such work, it came very hard. About three o'clock of that day, I broke down. My strength failed me. I was seized with a violent aching of the head, attended with extreme dizziness. I trembled in every limb. Finding what was coming, I nerved myself up, feeling it would never do to stop work. I stood as long as I could stagger to the hopper with crane. When I could no longer, when I could stand no longer, I fell and felt as if held down by an immense weight. The fan, of course, stopped. Everyone had his own work to do and no one could do the work of the other and have his own go at the same time. Mr. Covey was at the house about 100 yards from the treading yard where we were fanning. On hearing the fan stopped, he left immediately and came to the spot where we were. He hastily inquired what the matter was. Bill answered that I was sick and there was no one to bring wheat to the fan. I had by this time crawled away under the side of the post and rail fence by which the yard was enclosed, hoping to find relief by getting out of the sun. He then asked where I was. He was told by one of the hands. He came to the spot and after looking at me a while, asked me what was the matter. I told him as well as I could, for I scarce had strength to speak. He then gave me a savage kick on the side and told me to get up. I tried to do so, but fell back in the attempt. He gave me another kick and again told me to rise. I tried again and succeeded in gaining my feet, but stooping to get the tub with which I was feeding the fan, I again staggered and fell. While down in the situation, Mr. Covey took up the hickory slat with which Hughes had been striking off the half bushel measure and with it gave me a heavy blow upon the head, making a large wound and the blood ran freely. And with this again told me to get up. I made no effort to comply having now made up my mind to let him do his worst. In a short time after receiving this blow, my head grew better. Mr. Covey had now left me to my fate. At this moment, I resolved for the first time to go to my master, enter a complaint and ask his protection. In order to do this, I must that afternoon walk seven miles. And this, under the circumstances, was a truly severe undertaking. I was exceedingly feeble, made so as much by the kicks and blows which I received as by the severe fits of sickness to which I had been subjected. I, however, watched my chance. While Covey was looking in an opposite direction and started for St. Michael's, I succeeded in getting a considerable distance on my way to the woods when Covey discovered me and called after me to come back, threatening what he would do if I did not come. I disregarded both his calls and his threats and made my way to the woods as fast as my feeble state would allow and thinking I might be overhauled by him if I kept the road. I walked through the woods, keeping far enough from the road to avoid detection and near enough to prevent losing my way. I had not gone far before my little strength had failed me. I could go no further. I fell down and lay for a considerable time. The blood was yet oozing from the wound on my head. 
for a time, I thought I should bleed to death. And think now that I should have done so, but that the blood so matted my hair as to stop the wound. After lying there about three quarters of an hour, I nerved myself up again and started on my way through bogs and briars, barefooted and bareheaded, tearing my feet sometimes in nearly every step. And after a journey of about seven miles, occupying some five hours to perform it, I arrived at master's store. I then presented an appearance enough to affect any but a heart of iron. From the crown of my head to my feet, I was covered in blood. My hair was all clotted with dust and blood. My shirt was stiff with blood. I suppose I looked like a man who escaped the den of wild beasts and barely escaped them. In this state, I appeared before my master, humbly interposed to me for my protection. I told him all the circumstances as well as I could, and it seemed as I spoke at times to affect him. He would then walk the floor and seek to justify Covey by saying he expected I deserved it. He asked me what I wanted. I told him to let me get a new home, that as sure as I live with Mr. Covey again, I shall live with, but to die with him. The Covey would surely kill me. He was in a fair way for it. Thomas ridiculed the idea that there was any danger of Mr. Covey's killing me. And he said that he knew Mr. Covey, that he was a good man, and that he could not think of taking me from him. That should he do so, he would lose the whole year's wages, that I belonged to Mr. Covey for one year, and that I must go back to him, come what might, and that I must not trouble him with any more stories, or that he would himself get hold of me. After threatening me thus, he gave me a very large dose of salts, telling me that I might remain in St. Michael's that night, it being quite late, but that I must be off back to Mr. Covey's early in the morning, and that if I did not, he would get hold of me, which meant that he would whip me. I remained all night, and according to his orders, I started off to Covey's in the morning, Saturday morning, wearied in body and broken in spirit. I got no supper that night or breakfast in the morning. I reached Covey's about nine o'clock, and just as I was getting over the fence that divided Mrs. Kemp's fields from, our, from ours, out ran Covey with his cow skin to give me another whipping. Before he could reach me, I succeeded in getting to the cornfield and as the corn was very high, it afforded me the means of hiding. He seemed very angry and searched for me a long time. His behavior was altogether unaccountable. He finally gave up the chase, thinking, I suppose, that I must come home for something to eat. He would give himself no further trouble in looking for me. I spent that day mostly in the woods, having the alternative before me to go home and be whipped to death or stay in the woods and be starved to death. That night, I fell in with Sandy Jenkins, a slave with whom I was somewhat acquainted. Sandy had a free wife who lived about four miles from Mr. Covey's and it being Saturday, he was on his way to see her. I told him my circumstances and he very kindly invited me to go home with him. I went home with him and talked this whole matter over and got his advice as to what course it was best for me to pursue. I found Sandy an old advisor. He told me with great solemnity, I must go back to Covey, but that before I went, I must go with him to another part of the woods where there was a certain route, which if I would take some of it with me, carrying it always on my right side will, would render it impossible for Mr. Covey or any other white man to whip me. He said he had carried it for years and since he had done so, he had never received a blow and never expected to while he carried it. I at first rejected the idea, 
the simple carrying of a root in my pocket would have any such effect as he had said, but was not disposed to take it. But Sandy impressed the necessity with, with much earnestness, telling me it could do no harm if it did no good. To please him, I at length took the root and, according to his direction, carried it upon my right side. This was Sunday morning. I immediately started for home, and upon entering the yard, came to Covey on his way to the meeting. He spoke very kindly, bade me to drive the pigs from the lot nearby and pass on towards the church. Now, the singular conduct of Mr. Covey really made me begin to think that there was something in the root which Sandy had given me. And had it been on any other day than Sunday, I could have attributed the conduct to no other cause than the influence of the root. And as it was, I was half inclined to think the root to be something more than I at first had taken it to be. All went well till Monday morning. On this morning, the virtue of the root was fully tested. Long before daylight, I was called to go and rub, curry, and feed the horses. I obeyed and was glad to obey. But whilst thus engaged, whilst in the act of throwing down some blades from the loft, Mr. Covey entered the stable with a long rope. And just as I was half out of the loft, he caught hold of one of my legs and was about tying me. As soon as I found what he was up to, I gave a sudden spring. And as I did so, he holding to my legs, I was brought sprawling to the stable floor. Mr. Covey seemed now to think he had me and could do what he pleased. But at this moment, from whence came the spirit, I don't know. I resolved to fight and suiting my action to the resolution, I seized Covey hard by the throat. And as I did so, I rose. He held on to me and I to him. My resistance was so entirely unexpected that Covey seemed taken all aback. He trembled like a leaf. This gave me assurance and I held him uneasy, causing the blood to run where I touched him with the ends of my fingers. Mr. Covey soon called out to Hughes for help. Hughes came in and while Covey held me, I attempted to tie my right hand. While he was in the act of doing so, I watched my chance and gave him a heavy kick close under the ribs. This kick fairly sickened Hughes so that he left me in the hands of Mr. Covey. This kick had the effect of not only weakening Hughes, but also Covey. When he saw Hughes bending over with pains, his courage quailed. He asked me if I meant to persist in my resistance. I told him I did, come what might, that he had used me like a brute for six months and that I was determined to be used so no longer. With that, he strove to drag me to a stick that was lying just out of the stable door. He meant to knock me down, but just as he was leaning over to get the stick, I seized him with both hands by his collar and brought him by a sudden snatch to the ground. By this time, Bill came. Cubby called upon him for assistance. Bill wanted to know what he could do. Cubby said, take hold of him, take hold of him. Bill said his master hired him out to work and not to help whip me. So he left Cubby and myself to fight our own battle out. We were at it for nearly two hours. Cubby at length let me go, puffing and blowing at a great rate saying that if I had not resisted, he would not have whipped me half as much. The truth was that he had not whipped me at all. I considered him as getting entirely the worst end of the bargain, for he had drawn no blood from me, but I had from him. The whole six months afterwards that I spent with Mr. Covey, he never laid the weight of his finger upon me in anger. He would occasionally say, 
he didn't want to get hold of me again. No, thought I, you need not, for you will come off worse than you did before. This battle with Mr. Covey was a turning point in my career as a slave. It would kindle a few expiring embers of freedom and revive within me a sense of my own manhood, parted self-confidence, and inspired me again with a determination to be free. Came afforded by the triumph was a full compensation for whatever else my self. He can only understand the deep satisfaction which I experience who has himself repelled by the force, the bloody arm of slavery. I felt as I never felt before. It was a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery to the heaven of freedom. My long crushed spirit rose, cowardice departed, bold defiance took its place. I had now resolved that however long I might remain a slave in form, the day had passed forever when I could be a slave in fact. I did not hesitate to let it be known of me that the white man who expected to succeed in whipping me would also succeed in killing me. From this time, I was never again what might be called fairly whipped, though I remained a slave four years afterwards. I had several fights, but was never whipped. It was for a long time a matter of surprise to me why Mr. Covey did not immediately have me taken by the constable to the whipping post and there regularly whipped for the crime of raising my hand against a white man in defense of myself. And the only explanation I can now think of does not entirely satisfy me, but such as it is, I will give it. Mr. Covey enjoyed the most unbounded reputation for being a first-rate overseer and Negro breaker. It was of considerable importance to him. That reputation was at stake, and had he sent me, a boy, about 16 years old, to the public whipping post, his reputation would have also been lost. So, to save his reputation, he suffered me to go unpunished. My term of actual service to Mr. Edward Covey ended on Christmas Day, 1833. The days between Christmas and New Year's Day are allowed as holidays, and accordingly, we were not required to perform any labor more than to feed and take care of the stock. This time, we regarded as our own by the graces of our master, and we therefore used or abused it nearly as we please. Those of us who had families at a distance were generally allowed to spend the whole six days in their society. This time, however, was spent in various ways. The staid, sober thinking, and industrious ones of our number would employ themselves in making corn brooms, mats, horse collars, and baskets. And another class of us would spend the time in hunting possums, hares, and coons. But by far the larger part engaged in such sports and merriments as playing ball, wrestling, running foot races, fiddling, dancing, and drinking whiskey. And this latter mode of spending the time was by far the most agreeable to the feelings of our masters. A slave who would work during the holidays was considered by our masters scarcely deserving him. He is regarded as one who rejected the favor of his master. He was deemed a disgrace not to get drunk at Christmas, and he was regarded as lazy indeed, who had not provided himself with the necessary means during the year to get whiskey enough to last him through Christmas. From what I know of the effect of these holidays upon the slave, I believe them to be among the most effective means in the hands of the slaveholder in keeping down the spirit of insurrection. Were the slaveholders at once abandoned this practice, I have not the slightest doubt it would lead to an immediate insurrection among the slaves. These holidays serve as conductors or safety valves to carry off the rebellious spirit of enslaved humanity. But for these, the slave would be forced up to the wildest desperation and woe betide the slaveholder 
the day he ventures to remove or hinder the operation of these conductors. I warn him that in such an event, a spirit will go forth in their midst, more to be dreaded than the most appalling earthquake. The holidays are part and parcel of the gross fraud, wrong, and inhumanity of slavery. They are professedly a custom established by the benevolence of the slaveholders. But I undertake to say it is the result of selfishness and one of the grossest frauds committed upon the downtrodden slave. They did not give the slaves this time because they would not like to have their work during its continuance. But because they know it would be unsafe to deprive them of it, this will be seen by the fact that the slaveholders like to have their slaves spend those days just in such a manner as to make them as glad of their ending as of their beginning. Their object seems to be to discuss their slaves with freedom by plunging them into the lowest depths of dissipation. For instance, the slaveholders not only like to see the slave drink of his own accord, but will adopt various plans to make him drunk. One plan is to make bets on their slaves as to who can drink the most whiskey without getting drunk. And in this way, they succeed in getting whole multitudes to drink to excess. Thus, when the slave asks for virtuous freedom, the cunning slaveholder, knowing his ignorance, cheats him with a dose of vicious dissipation, artfully labeled with the name of liberty. The most of us used to drink it down and the result was just what might be supposed. Many of us were led to think that there was little to choose between liberty and slavery. We felt, and very properly too, that we had almost as well be slaves to man as to rum. So when the holidays ended, we staggered up from the filth of our wallowing, took a long breath and marched to the field. Feeling upon the whole, rather glad to go from what our master had deceived us into belief was a freedom back to the arms of slavery. I have said that this mode of treatment is part of the whole system of fraud and inhumanity of slavery. It is so. The mode here adopted to discuss the slave with freedom by allowing him to see only the abuse of it is carried out in other things. For instance, a slave loves molasses. He steals some. His master, in many cases, goes off to town and buys a large quantity. He returns, takes his whip, and commands the slave to eat the molasses until the poor fellow is made sick at the very mention of it. The same mode is sometimes adopted to make the slave refrain from asking for more food than a regular allowance. A slave runs through his allowance and applies for more. His master is enraged at him, but not willing to send him off without food, gives him more than is necessary and compels him to eat within a given time. Then if he complains that he cannot eat, he is said to be satisfied, neither full nor fasting, and is whipped for being hard to please. I have an abundance of such illustrations of the same principle drawn from my own observation, but think the cases I have cited sufficient. The practice is a very common one. On the 1st of January, 1834, I left Mr. Covey and went to live with Mr. William Freeland, who lived about three miles from St. Michael's. I soon found Mr. Freeland a very different man from Mr. Covey. Though not rich, he was what you would call an educated Southern gentleman. Mr. Covey, as I have shown, was well-trained Negro breaker and slave driver. The former slaveholder, though he was, seemed to possess some regard for honor, some reverence for justice, and some respect for humanity. The latter seemed totally insensible to all such sentiments. Mr. Freeland had many of the faults peculiar to slaveholders, such as being passionate and fretful. But I must do him justice to say 
that he was exceedingly free from those degrading vices to which Mr. Covey was constantly addicted. The one was open and frank, and he was always knew, knew where to find him. The other was a most artful deceiver and could be understood only by such as were skillful enough to detect his cunning devised frauds. Another advantage I gained in my new master was he made no pretension or profession of religion. And this, in my opinion, was truly a great advantage. I assert most unhesitantly that the religion of the South is a mere covering for the most horrid crimes, a justifier of the most appalling barbarity, a sanctifier of the hateful frauds, and the dark shelter under which the darkest, foulest, grossest, and most infernal deeds of slaveholders find the strongest protection. Were I to be again reduced to, again, reduced to the chains of slavery, Next to the enslavement, I should regard being the slave of a religious master, the greatest calamity to ever befall me. For of all slaveholders to whom I have ever met, religious slaveholders are the worst. I have ever found them to be the meanest and the baddest, the most cruel and cowardly of all others. It was my unhappy lot not only to belong to a religious slaveholder, but to live in a community of such religionists. Very near Mr. Freeland lived with, Mr. with Reverend Daniel Wheaton, and in the same neighborhood lived Reverend Whitby Hopkins. These were members and ministers in the Reformed Methodist Church, Mr. Wheaton owned, among others, a woman, a woman slave whose name I have forgotten. This woman's back for weeks was kept literally raw, made so by the lash of his merciless religious wretch. He used to, he used height to hire hands. His maxim was behave well or behave ill. It is the duty of a master occasionally to whip a slave, to remind him of his master's authority. Such was his theory and such was his practice. Mr. Hopkins was even worse than Mr. Whedon. His chief boast was his ability to manage slaves. The peculiar feature of his government was that of whipping slaves in advance of deserving it. He always managed to have one or more of his slaves to whip every Monday morning. He did this to alarm their fears and strike terror into those who escaped. His plan was to whip for those smallest offenses to prevent the commission of larger ones. Mr. Hopkins could always find some excuse for whipping a slave. It would astonish one unaccustomed to a slave holding his life to see with what wonderful ease a slaveholder could find things of which to make occasion to whip a slave. A mere look, word, or motion, a mistake, accident, or what a want of power are all matters of which a slave may be whipped at any time. Does a slave look dissatisfied? Is it, it, it's, it is said, he was the, has the devil in him and it must be whipped out. Does he speak loudly when spoken to by his master? Then he is getting high-minded and should be taken down a buttonhole. Does he forget to pull off his hat at, at the approach of a white person? then he is wanting in reverence and should be whipped for it. Does he venture to vindicate his conduct when censured for it? Then he is guilty of imprudence, one of the greatest crimes of which a slave can be guilty. Does he ever venture to suggest a different, different mode of doing things from that pointed out by his master? He indeed in presumptuous and getting above himself and nothing less than flogging will do for him. Does he, while plowing, break a plow? Or while hoeing, break a hoe? It is owning to, to his carelessness. For it, a slave must always be whipped. Mr. Hopkins could fi always find something of this sort to justify the use of the lash. And he seldom failed to embrace such opportunities. There was not a man in the whole country with whom the slaves who had the getting their own home 
would, would not prefer to live rather than with Reverend Mr. Hopkins. And yet there was not many any around who made higher professions of religion, was more active in revivals, more attentive to the class, love fest, prayer, and preaching meetings, or more devotional in his family that prayed early, later, louder, and longer than this same revived slave driver, Rick B. Hopkins. But to return to Mr. Freeland and to my experience while in his employment, he, like Mr. Covey, gave us enough to eat, but unlike Mr. Covey, he always gave us sufficient time to take our meals. He worked us hard, but always between sunrise and sunset. He required a good deal of work to be done, but gave us good tools with which to do the work. His farm was large, but he employed hands enough to work it. And with ease compared with, and with ease compared to many of my neighbors. My treatment while in his employment was heavily compared with what I experienced in the hands of Edward Covey. Mr. Freeland was himself the owner of but two slaves. Their name were Henry Harris and John Harris. The rest of his hands he hired. These consisted of myself, Sandy Jenkins, Astrid, and Handy Cardwell. Henry and John were quite intelligent. And in a very little while after I went there, I succeeded in creating a them a very strong desire to learn to read. To desire soon, the desire soon sprang up and others around also. They were very soon mustered up some old spelling books and nothing would do but that I must keep a Sabbath school. I agreed to do so and, according, and accordingly devoted my Sundays to teaching these loved fellow slaves how to read. Neither of them knew of his letters when I went there. Some of, the, some of the slaves of the neighboring farms found what I was going on and also availed themselves of this little opportunity to learn to read. I was understood among all who came that there must be little display about, what, about it as possible. It was necessary to keep our religious masters at St. Michael's unaccompanied to the fact that Instead of spending the Sabbath in wrestling, boxing, or drinking whiskey, we were trying to learn how to read the will of God. For they had much rather see us engaged in those degrading sports than to see us behaving like intellectual, moral, and accountable beings. In my blood boils as I think of the bloody manner in which Masters Wright Fairbanks and Garrison West both class leaders, in connection with many others, rushed in upon us with sticks and stones and break up our virtuous little Sabbath school. At St. Michael's, all calling themselves Christians, horrible followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am again digressing. I held my Sabbath school at the house of a free colored man, whose, man, whose name I deem it imprudent to mention, for it shouldn't be known, it might embarrass him greatly, though the crime of holding the school was committed 10 years ago. I had at once time over 40 school scholars and those in the right sort ardently desiring to learn. They were of all ages, but mostly men and women. I look back at those Sundays with an almost pleasure not to be expressed. They were great days to my soul. The work of instructing my dear fellow slaves was the sweetest engagement with which I have ever been blessed. We loved each other, and to leave them at the close of Sabbath was a severe cross indeed. When I think that my precious souls are, when these precious souls are today shut up in a prison of slavery, my feelings overcome me, and I am almost ready to ask, does a righteous God govern the universe? And for what does he hold the thunders in his right hand if not to smite the, impress, the oppressor and deliver the spoil out of the hand of the spoiler? These dear souls came, souls came not to the Sabbath school because it was popular to do so, nor did I teach them because I was reputable to be, uh, I was reputable to be thus engaged. Every moment they spent at that school, they were liable to be taken up and given 39 lashes. They came there because they wished to learn. Their minds had been starved by the cruel masters. 
they had been shut up in mental darkness. I fought them because them because I taught them because I was it was the delight of my soul to be doing something that looked like bettering the condition of my race. I kept up my school nearly a whole year. I lived with Mr. Freeland, and besides my Sabbath school, I devoted three evenings in the week during the winter to teaching the slaves at home. I had the happiness to know that several of those who came to the Sabbath school learned how to read, and that one at least is now free through my agency. The year passed off smoothly. It seemed only about half as long as the year was, it preceded it. I went through it without receiving a single blow. I will give Mr. Freeland the credit of being the best master I've ever had till I became the master of myself. For the ease with which I passed that year, I was, however, somewhat indebted to the society of my fellow slaves. They were noble souls. They were not only possessed loving hearts, but brave ones. We were linked and interlinked with each other. I love them with a love stronger than anything than anything I have experienced since. It is something said that we slaves do not love and combine with each other. In answer to this assertion, I can say I never loved any or confided in any people more than my fellow slaves, and in especially those with whom I lived at Mr. Freeland's. I believe we would have died for each other. We never undertook to do anything of any importance without mutual consultation. We never moved separately. We were one, and as such, we to do so, our tempers and dispositions, as by the mutual hardships to which we were necessarily subjected by our condition as slaves. At the close of the year 1934, Mr. Freeland again hired me of my master for the year of 1835. But by this time, I began to want to live upon free land as well as well with Freeland. And I was no longer content, therefore, to live with him or any other slaveholder. I began with the commencement of the year to prepare myself for the final struggle, which should decide my fate one way or another. My tendency was upward. I was fast approaching manhood, and the year after year, and year after year had passed, and I had still, I was still a slave. These soft thoughts roused me. I must do something. There, I therefore resolved that 1835 should not pass without witnessing an attempt on my part to secure my liberty. But I was not willing to cherish such a determination alone. My fellow slaves were dear to me. I was anxious to have them participate in this with me, my life-giving determination. I therefore, though with great prudence, commenced early to ascertain their views and feelings in regards to their condition and to imbue their minds with the thoughts of freedom. I bent myself to devising ways and means for our escape and meanwhile strove on all fitting occasions to impress them with the gross fraud and inhumanity of slavery. I went first to Henry, next to John, then to the others. I found in them all warm hearts and noble spirits. They were ready to hear and ready to act when a feasible plan should be proposed. This was what I wanted. I talked to them of our want for manhood, if we submitted to our enslavement without at least one noble effort to be free, we met often and consulted frequently and told our hopes and fears, recounted difficulties, real and in magic, which we should be called upon to meet. At times, we were almost disposed to give up and try to content ourselves with, their, with our wretched lot. At other times, we were firm and unbending in our determination to go. Whenever we struggled in any plan, there was shrinking. The odds were fearful. Our path was beset with the greatest of obstacles. And if we succeeded in gaining the end of it, our right to be free was yet questionable. We were yet liable to be returned to bondage. We could see no spot this side of the ocean where we could be free. We knew nothing about Canada. Our knowledge of the North did not extend farther than New York, 
and to go there and to be far, for, forever harassed with the frightful liability of being returned to slavery, with the, certain being, with the certainty of being treated tenfold worse than before. The thought was truly horrible one, and one in which was not easy to overcome. The case sometimes stood thus, at every gate through which we were to pass, we saw a watchman, and at every ferry, a guard, on every bridge, a sentinel, and in every wood, a patrol. We were hemmed up upon every side. Here were the difficulties, real or imagined, the good to be, the good to be sought and the evil to be shunned. On the one hand, there stood slavery, a stern reality glaring frightfully upon us, its robes already crimsoned with the blood of millions, and even now feasting, its greedily, feasting itself greedily upon our flesh. On the other hand, the way back to the dim distance, under the flickering light of the North Star, behind, behind some cra craggy hill or snow-covered mountain, Stood the doubtful, stood a doubtful freedom, half frozen, beckoning us, beckoning us to come and share its hospitality. This itself was sometimes even enough to stagger us. But when we permitted ourselves to survey the road, we were frequently appalled. Upon either side, we saw a grim death, assuming most horrid shapes. Now it was starvation, causing us to eat our own flesh. Now we were contending with the waves. We were drowning. Now we were overtaken, torn to the pieces by the fangs of terrible bloodhound. We were stung by scorpions, chased by wild beasts, bitten by snakes, and finally then having nearly reached the desired spot after swimming the rivers, encountering the wild beasts, sleeping in the woods, suffering hunger and nakedness, we were overtaken by our pursuers. And in our resistance, we were shot dead upon the spot. I say this picture sometimes appalled us and it made us rather bear those ills we had than fly to others that we know not of. In coming to a fixed determination to run away, we did more than Patrick Henry. We resolved upon liberty or death. With us, it was a doubtful liberty at most, and almost certain death if failed. For my part, I should prefer death to hopeless bondage. Sandy, one of our number, gave up the notion, but still encouraged us. Our company then consisted of Henry Harris, John Harris, Henry Bailey, Charles Roberts, and myself. Henry Bailey was my uncle and belonged to my master. Charles married my, married my aunt. He, be, he belonged to my master's father-in-law and William, Mr. William Hamilton. The plan we finally concluded upon was to get a large canoe belonging to Mr. Hamilton and upon the Saturday night previous to Easter holiday, paddled directly to the Chesapeake Bay. On our arrival at the head of the bay, a distance of 70 or 80 miles from where we live, it was proposed to turn the canoe adrift and follow the guidance of the North Star till we got beyond the limits of Maryland. Our reasoning for taking the water route was that we were less liable to be su suspected as runaways. We hope we'd be regarded as fishermen, whereas if we should take the land route, we should be subjected to interruptions of almost every kind. Anyone having a white face and being disposed could stop us and subject us to examination. The week before our intended start, I wrote several protections, one, of, one for each of us. As well as I could remember, they were in the following words of to wit. This is to certify that I, under Simon, have given the bearer, my servant, full liberty to go to Baltimore and spend Easter holiday, written with mine own hands, etc. 1935, William Hamilton, near St. Michael's in Talbot County, Maryland. We were not going to Baltimore. But in going up the bay, we went toward Baltimore, and these protections were only intended to protect us while on the bay. As the time drew near for our departure, our anxiety became more and more intense. It was truly a matter of life and death with us. The strength of our determination was about to be fully tested, 
At this time, I was very active in explaining every difficulty, removing every doubt, dispelling every fear, and inspiring all with the firmness indispensable, indispensable to, to success in our undertaking, Unsh uh, assuring them that half was gained the instant we made the move and, then, and had talked long enough we were now ready to move. If not now, we, would, we never should be. And if we did not intend to move now, we had as well fold our arms, sit down and acknowledge ourselves fit only to be slaves. This none of us were prepared to acknowledge. Every man stood firm. And at our last meeting, we pledged ourselves afresh in the most solemn manner that at the time appointed, we would certainly start up in pursuit of freedom. This was in the middle of the week, at the end of which we would be off. We, we went, as usual, to our several fields of labor, but with bosoms highly agitated with the thoughts of our truly hazardous undertaking. We tried to conceal our feelings as much as possible, and I think we succeeded very well. After a, a painful waiting, the Saturday morning, whose night was to witness our departure, came. I hailed it with joy. Bring what sadness it might, Friday night was a sleepless one for me. I, pro prob I probably felt more anxious than the rest, but because I was, by common con's consent, at the head of the whole affair. The responsibility of success or failure lay heavily upon me. The glory of the one and the confusion of the other were alike, were alike mind. The first two hours at the morning were, were such as I never experienced before and hope never again. Early in the morning, I went as usual to the field. We were spreading manure and all at once while thus ad, uh, engaged, I was overwhelmed with the indescribable feeling in the fullness of which I turned to Sandy who was nearby and said, we are betrayed. Well, he said, that thought was the moment struck me. He, we said no more. I was no more certain of anything. The horn was blown as usual, and we went up for the field to the house for breakfast. I went for, for the form more than for want of anything to eat that morning. Just as I got to the house and looking out at the lane gate, I saw four white men with two colored men. The white men were on horseback and the colored ones were walking behind as if tied. I watched them a few moments till they got up to our lane gate. Here they halted and they tied the colored men to the gate posts. I was not yet certain as to what the matter was. In a, in a few moments, in rode Mr. Hamilton with a speed betokening great excitement. He came to the door and inquired if Master Williams was in. When he was told, he was at the barn. Mr. Hamilton, without dismounting, rode to the barn with extraordinary speed. In a few moments, he said, Mr. Freeland returned to the house. By this time, the three constables rode up and the great haste dismounted, tied their horses, and met Mr. Williams and Mr. Hamilton returning from the barn. And after taking a while, they walked up to the kitchen door. There was no one in the kitchen but myself and John. Henry and Sandy were up at the barn. Mr. Freeland put his head at the door and called me by name, saying there were some gentlemen at the door who wished to see me. I stepped to the door and inquired what they wanted. They were once they they at once seized me and without giving me any satisfaction, tied me lashing my hands closing close together. I insisted upon knowing what the matter was. They at, they at length said that they had learned I had been in scrap and that I was to be examined before my master. If there was any information proved false, I should not be hurt. In a few moments, I succeeded in tying Don, John then turned to Henry, who had by this time returned and commanded him to cross his hands. I won't, said Henry in a firm tone and, and indicating his readiness to meet the consequences of his refusal. Won't you, said Tom Graham, the constable. No, I won't, said Henry. 
in a still stronger tone. With this, two of the constables pulled out their shining pistols and swore by their creator that they would make him cross his hands or kill him. Each cocked their pistols and with fingers on the trigger walked up to Henry saying at this, at the same time, if he did not cross his hands, they would blow his damned heart out. Shoot me, shoot me, said Henry. You can't kill me but once. Shoot, shoot, and be damned. I won't be tired. This he said in a tone of loud defiance, and at the same time with a motion as quick as lightning, he with one single stroke dashed the pistols from the hands of each constable. And he did this all, as he did this, all hands fell upon him. And after beating him some time, they finally overpowered him and got him tied. During the scuffle, I managed, I managed, I know not how, to get my pass out and without being discovered, put it into the fire. We were all tied and we were to leave for Easton Jail. Betsy Freeland, mother of William Freeland, came to the door with her hands full of biscuits and divided them between Henry and Jim. She then delivered herself a, a, help, a speech to you following effect. Addressing herself to me, she said, you devil, you yellow devil, it was you that put it into the heads of Henry and John to run away. But for you, the long-legged mulatto devil, Henry nor John would never have thought of such a thing. I made no reply and was immediately hurried off towards St. Michael's. Just a moment previous to the scuffle with Henry, Mr. Hamilton suggested the property, the propriety of making a search for the pretend protections which he had understood Frederick had written for himself and the rest. But just at that moment, he was about to carry his approach into effect. His aid was in need of helping to tie Henry and the excitement attending the scuffle caused them either to forget or to deem it unsafe under the circumstances to do the search. So we were not yet convicted of the intention to run away. When we got about halfway to St. Michael's, while the constables having us in charge were looking ahead, Henry inquired of me what he should do with his pass. I told him to eat it with his biscuit and, and own nothing. We passed the word around, own nothing and own nothing, we said we all. Our confidence in each other was unshaken. We were resolved to succeed or fail together. After the calamity had befallen us as much before, we were now preparing for anything. We were to be dragged at morning 15 miles behind horses and then placed in Easton jail. Then when we reached St. Michael's, we underwent a sort of examination. We all denied that we were ever intended to run away. We did this more to bring out the evidence against us than from any hope of getting clear of being sold. For, as I had said, we were ready for that. And, and the fact was, we cared but little where we went. So we went, so we went as, as so we went together. Our greatest concern was about separation. We dreaded that more than, any, that more than anything, this side of death. We found the evidence against us to be the testimony of one person. Our master would not tell us who it was, but it came to an anonymous decision among ourselves as to whom the informant was. We were sent off to Easton Jail. When we got there, we were delivered up to the sheriff, Mr. Joseph Graham, and by him placed in jail. Henry, John, and myself were placed in one room together, Charles, Henry, and Bailey in another. Their, their object in separation was to hinder concert. We had been in jail scarcely 20 minutes when a swarm of slave traders and agents for slave traders flocked into the jail to look at us and to ascertain if we were for sale. Such a set of, set of beings I never saw before. I felt myself surrounded by so many friends, a part of, fr friends from perdition. A band of pirates never looked more like their father, the devil. They laughed and grinned over us, saying, oh, boys, 
we have got you, haven't we? And after taunting us in various ways, they one by one went into the examination of us with the intent to ascertain our value. They would prudent, imprudently ask us if we would not like to have them for our master. We would make them no answer and leave them to find out as best they could. Then they could curse and swear at us, telling us that they could take the devil out of us in every little while if we were only in their hands. While in jail, we found ourselves in much more comfortable quarters than we expected when we went there. We did not get much to eat, nor that which was very good, but we had a good clean room from the windows of which we could see what was going on in the street, which was very much better than those we had had been placed in one of the dark, damp cells. Upon the whole, we got along very well, so far as the jail and its keeper were concerned. Immediately after the holidays were over, contrary to all expectations, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Freeland came up to the Easton and took Charles and, and the two Henrys and John out of jail and carried them home, leaving me alone. I regarded this separation as a final, as a final one. It caused me more pain than anything else I, in the whole transaction. I was ready for, any, for anything rather than separation. I suppose that they had consulted together and had decided that as I was the whole cause of the intention of the others to run away, it was hard to make the innocent suffer with the guilty and that they had therefore concluded to make the others and to sell me, take the others and to sell me as a warning to the others that wrapped the remained. It is, a, it is due to noble Henry to say, he seemed almost as reluctant at leaving the prison as at leaving home to come to the prison. But we knew we should, in all probability, be separated. If we were sold, and since he was in their hands, he concluded to go peacefully at home. I was now left to my fate. I was all alone and within the walls of a stone prison. But a few days before, I was full of hope. I expected to have been safe in the land of freedom, but now I was covered with gloom, sunk down to the utmost despair. I thought the possibilities of freedom were gone. I was kept in this way about a week, at the end of which Captain Aud, my master, to my surprise and utter astonishment, came up and took me out with the intention of sending me with a gentleman of, gentleman of his acquaintance into Alabama. But from some cause or another, he did not send me to Alabama, but concluded to send me back to Baltimore to live again with his brother Hugh and learn to trade. Thus, after an absence of three years and one month, I was once more permitted to return to my old home of Baltimore. My master sent me away because there, were, they, there existed against me a very great prejudice in the community and he feared I might be killed. In a few weeks after I went to Baltimore, Master Hugh hired me to Mr. William Gardner, an extensive shipbuilder on Fells Point. I was put there to learn how to caulk. I, however, proved to be unfavorably placed, placed for the accomplishment of this object. Mr. Gardner was engaged that spring in building two large man-of-war brigs professed for the Mexican government. The vessels were to be launched in July of that year, and in failure of thereof, Mr. Gardner was to lose a considerable sum, so that when I entered, all was hurried. There was no time to learn anything. Every man had to do that which, which he knew how to do. In entering the shipyards, my orders from Mr. Gardner were to do whatever the carpenters commanded me to do. This was placing me in the back and beck and call of about 75 men. I was to regard all these men as masters. Their word was to be my law. My situation was, most try was the most trying one. At times, I needed a dozen pair of hands. I was called a dozen ways in a space of a single man. Three or four voices would strike my ear at the same moment 
It was, Fred, come here, here, here and can't chant this timber. Fred, come here, this timber yonder. Fred, bring the roller here. Fred, go get the fresh can of water. Fred, come here and saw off the end of this timber. Fred, go quick and get this crowbar. Fred, hold the end of this fall. Fred, go to the blast mix shop and get the new punch. Hurrah, Fred, run and bring me a cold chisel. I say, Fred, bear a hand. Get a fire as quick as a lightning under the steam box. Hello, nigger, come turn this grindstone. Come, come, move, move, and bows these timber forward. I say, darky, blast your eyes. Why don't you heat up some pits? Hallo, hallo, hallo. Three voices at the same time. Come here, go there. Hold on, where are you? Damn it, if you move, I'll knock your brains out. This was my school for eight months, and I might have remained there longer, but for my most horrid fight I had with four of the white apprentices, in which my left eye was nearly knocked out, and I was horribly mangled in other respects. The facts in the case were these. Until a very little while after I went there, white and black ship carpenters worked side by side, and no one seemed any important propriety into it. All hands seemed very well satisfied. Many of the black carpenters were freemen. Things seemed to be going very well. All at once, the white carpenters knocked off and said that they would not work with free colored work, working. Their reason for this, as alleged, was that if free colored carpenters were encouraged, they would soon take the trade into their own hands and poor white men could go be thrown out of employment. They therefore felt called upon at once to put a stop to it. And taking advantage of Mr. Gardner's necessities, they broke off swearing they would not work no longer unless he would discharge his black carpenters. Now, though this did not extend to me in form, it did reach me in fact. My fellow apprentices very soon began to feel it was degrading for them to work with me. They began to put on airs and talk about the niggers taking the country, saying we all ought to be killed and being encouraged by the journeymen. They commenced making my condition as hard as they could by hectoring me around and sometimes striking me. I, of course, kept the vow I made after the fight with Mr. Kobe and struck back again, regardless of the consequence. And while I kept them combi from com combining, I succeeded very well. For I could whip the whole of them, taking them separately. They, however, at length combined and came upon me, armed with sticks and stones and heavy handpikes. One came in front with a half brick. There was one at each side of me and one behind. While I was attending to those in front, and the others on the side, the one behind, ran up with the hand spike and struck me heavily below upon the head. It stunned me. I fell. And with this, they all ran upon me and fell to beat me with their fists. I let them lay on for a while, gathering strength. In an instant, I gave a sudden surge and rose to my hands and knees. Just as I did, one of their number gave me with his heavy boot a powerful kick to the left eye. My eyeball seemed to have burst. When they saw my eye closed and badly swollen, they left me. With this, I seized a handpike and for the time pursued them. But here the carpenters interfered and I thought, I was, I thought might as well give it, give it up. I was impossible to stand by my hands against so many. All this took place in the sight of not less than 50 white shark ship carpenters, and not one interposed a friendly word. But some cried, kill the damned nigger, kill him, kill him. He struck a white person. I found my only chance for life was in flight. I succeeded in getting away without an additional blow and barely so. For to strike a white man is death in lynch law, by lynch law. And that was the law in Mr. Gardner's shipyard. Nor is there much of any other out of Mr. Gardner's shipyard. 
I went directly home, told the story to my, of my wrongs to Master Hugh. And I'm happy to say of him, irreligious as he was, his con conduct was heavenly. Compared with that of his brother Thomas, under similar circumstances, he listened intently to my narrative of circumstances, leading to the savage outrage, and gave my proofs of his strong indignation at it. The heart of my once overkind mistress was again melted into pity. My puffed out eye and blood covered face moved her to tears. She took a chair by me, washed my blood from my face, and with a mother's tenderness bound up my head, covering the wound, my wounded eye with a lean piece of fresh beef. It was almost compensation for my suffering to witness once more a manifestation of kindness from this once affectionate old mistress. Master Hugh was very much enraged. He gave expression to, of, to his feeling by pouring out curses upon the heads of those who did the deed. As soon as I got a little the better of my bruises, he took me with him to the Esquire Watson on Bond Street to see what could be done about the matter. Mr. Watson inquired who saw the assault committed. Master Hugh told him it was done in Mr. Gardner's shipyard and missed where there were a large company of men at work. As to that, he said, the deed was done and there was no question as to who did it. His answer was he could do nothing in the case unless some white man would come forward and testify. He could issue no warrant on my word. If I had been killed in the presence of thousands of colored people, their testimony combined would have been insufficient to have arrested one of the murderers. Master Hugh, for once, was compelled to say, this state of things was too bad. Of course, it was impossible to get any white man to volunteer his testimony on my behalf and against the white young men. Even those who may have sympathized with me were not prepared to do this. It required a degree of courage unknown to them to do so. For just at that time, the slightest manifestation of humanity toward a colored person was denounced as abolitionism and the name of subjective bearer to frightful liabilities. The watchwords of the bloody minded in the religion and those days damn the abolitionists and damn the niggers. There was nothing done and probably nothing would have been done if I had been killed. Such was and such remains the state of things in the Christian city of Baltimore. Master Hugh, finding he could get no redress, refused to let me go back again to Mr. Gardner. He kept me himself and his wife distressed my wound till it was again restored to hell. He took me into the shipyard with his foreman in the employment of Walter Price. There I was immediately set to caulking and very soon, soon learned the art of using my mallet and irons. In the course of one year from the time I left Mr. Gardner, I was able to command the highest wages given to the most experienced caulkers. I was now of some importance to my master. I was bringing him from six to seven dollars per week. I sometimes brought him nine dollars per week. My wages were a dollar and a half. And after leaving, after learning how to caulk, I sought my own employment, made my own contracts and collected the money which I earned. My pathway became much more smooth than before. My condition was much more comfortable. When I could get no caulking to do, I did nothing. During these leisure times, those old notions about freedom would steal me over again. When Mr. Gardner's employment, I was kept in such a perpetual world of excitement. I could think of nothing, scarcely, but my life. And in thinking of my life, I almost forgot about my liberty. I have observed that this is my experience of slavery that whenever my condition was improved, instead of increasing my contentment, it only increased my desire to be free and set me to thinking of plans to gain my freedom. I found that to make a, make a contented slave is to necessarily make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision 
and as far as possible and, and annihilate the power of reason. He must be able to detect, to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. He must be made to feel that slavery is right and he can be brought to that only when he ceases to be a man. I was now getting, as I had said, $1.50 per day. I contracted it, contracted for it. I earned it. It was paid to me. It was rightfully mine. Yet upon each returning Saturday night, I was compelled to deliver every cent of that money to Master Hugh. And why? Not because he earned it, not because he had any hand in earning it, not because I owed it to him, nor because he possessed the slightest shadow of a right to it, but solely because he had the power to compel me to give it up. The right of the grim visaged pirate upon the high seas is exactly the same. Chapter 11. I now come to the part of my life during which I planned and finally succeeded in making my escape from slavery. But before narrating any of the peculiar circumstances, I deem it proper to make known my intention not to state all the facts connected with the transaction. My reasons for pursuing this course may be understood from the following. First, were I to give a minute statement of all the facts, it is not only possible, but quite probable that others would thereby be involved in the most embarrassing difficulties. Secondly, such a statement would most undoubtedly induce greater vigilance on the part of the slaveholders than has existed heretofore among them, which would, of course, be the means of guarding a door whereby some dear brother bondman might escape his galling chains. I deeply regret the necessity that impels me to suppress anything of importance connected with my experience in slavery. It would afford me great pleasure indeed, as well as materially add to the interest of my narrative, were I at liberty to gratify a curiosity, which I know exists in the minds of many by an accurate statement of all the facts pertaining to my most fortunate escape. But I must deprive myself of this pleasure and the curious of the gratification which should a, such a statement would afford. I would allow myself to suffer under the greatest imputations which evil-minded men might suggest rather than exculpate myself and thereby run the hazard of closing the slightest avenue by which a brother slave might clear himself of the chains and fetters of slavery. I have never approved of the very manner in which some of our Western friends have conducted what they call the Underground Railroad, but which I think by their open declarations has been made most emphatically the Upper Ground Railroad. I honor those good men and women for their noble daring and applaud them for willingly subjecting themselves to bloody persecution by openly avowing their particip participation in the escape of slaves. I, however, can see very little good resulting from such a course, either to themselves or the slaves escaping while upon the other hand, I see and feel assured that those open declarations are a positive evil to the slaves remaining who are seeking to escape. They do nothing towards enlightening the slave, whilst they do much towards enlightening the master. They stimulate him to greater watchfulness and enhance his power to capture his slave. We owe something, we owe something to the slave south of the line as well as to those north of it and in aiding the latter on their way to freedom, we should be careful to do nothing which would be likely to hinder the former from escaping from slavery. I would keep the merciless slaveholder profoundly ignorant of the means of flight adopted by the slave. I would leave him to imagine himself surrounded by myriads of invisible tormentors ever ready to snatch from his infernal grasp his trembling prey. Let him be left to feel his way in the dark. Let dark commensurate with his crime hover over him and let him feel that at every step he takes in pursuit of the flying bondmen, he is running the frightful risk of having his hot brains dashed out by an invisible agency. Let us render the tyrant no aid. Let us not hold the light by which he can trace the footprints of our flying brother. But enough of this. 
I will now proceed to the statement of those facts connected with my escape for which I am alone responsible and for which no one can be made to suffer but myself. In the early part of the year, 1838, I became quite restless. I could see no reason why, sh why I should at the end of each week pour the reward of my toil into the purse of my master. When I carried to him my weekly wages, he would, after counting the money, look me in the face with a robber-like fierceness and ask, is this all? He was satisfied with nothing less than the last cent. He would, however, when I made him six dollars, sometimes give me six cents, just to encourage me. It had the opposite effect. I regarded it as a sort of admission of my right to the whole. The fact that he gave me any part of my wages was proof to my mind that he believed me entitled to the whole of them. I always felt worse for having received anything for I feared that the giving me a few cents would ease his conscience and make him feel himself to be a pretty honorable sort of robber. My discontent grew upon me. I was ever on the lookout for means of escape and finding no direct means, I determined to try to hire my time with a view of getting money with which to make my escape. In the spring of 1838, when Master Thomas came to Baltimore to purchase his spring goods, I got an opportunity and applied to him to allow me to hire my time. He unhesitatingly refused my request and told me this was another stratagem by which to escape. He told me I could go nowhere, but that he could get me, and that in the event of my running away, he should spare no pains in his efforts to catch me. He exhorted me to content myself and be obedient. He told me if I would be happy, I must lay out no plans for the future. He said if I behaved myself properly, he would take care of me. Indeed, he advised me to complete thoughtlessness of the future and taught me to depend solely upon him for happiness. He seemed to see fully the pressing necessity of setting aside my intellectual nature in order to contentment in slavery. But in spite of him, and even in spite of myself, I continued to think and to think about the injustice of my enslavement and the means of escape. About two months after this, I applied to Master Hugh for the privilege of hiring my time. He was not acquainted with the fact that I applied to Master Thomas and had been refused. He too, at first, seemed disposed to refuse, but after some reflection, he granted me the privilege and proposed the following terms. I was to be allowed all my time, make all contracts with those for whom I worked, and find my own employment, and in return for this liberty, I was to pay him $3 at the end of each week, find myself in caulking tools, and in board and clothing. My board was $2 and a half per week. This with the wear and tear of clothing and caulking tools made my regular expenses about $6 per week. This amount I was compelled to make up or relinquish the privilege of hiring my time. Rain or shine, work or no work, at the end of each week the money must be forthcoming or I must give up my privilege. This arrangement, it will be perceived, was decidedly in my master's favor. It relieved him of all need of looking after me. His money was sure. He received all the benefits of slaveholding without its evils, while I endured all the evils of a slave and suffered all the care and anxiety of a free man. I found it hard to bargain, but hard as it was, I thought it better than the old mode of getting along. It was a step towards freedom to be allowed to bear the responsibilities of free men, and I was determined to hold upon it. I bent myself to the work of making money. I was ready to work at night as well as day, and by the most untiring perseverance and industry, I made enough to meet my expenses and lay upon a little money every week. I went on thus from May to August. Master Hugh then refused to allow me to hire my time longer. The ground for his refusal was a failure on my part one Saturday night to pay him for my week's time. Uh, this failure was occasioned by my attending a camp meeting about 10 miles from Baltimore. During the week, 
I had entered into an engagement with a number of young friends to start from Baltimore to the campground early Saturday evening. And being determined by my employer, I was unable to get to Master Hughes without disappointing the company. I knew that Master Hugh was in no special need of the money that night. I therefore decided to go to camp meeting and upon my return, pay him $3. I stayed at the camp meeting one day longer than I intended when I left. But as soon as I returned, I called upon him to pay him what he considered his due. I found him very angry. He could scarce restrain his wrath. He said he had a great mind to give me a severe whipping. He wished to know how I dared go out of the city without asking his permission. I told him I hired my time and while I paid him the price which he asked for, I did not know what I was bound to ask him when and where I should go. This reply troubled him. And after reflecting a few moments, he turned to me and said I should hire my time no longer, that the next thing he should know of, I would be running away. Upon the same plea, he told me to bring my tools and clothing home forthwith. I did so, but instead of seeking work, as I had been accustomed to do previously to hiring my time, I spent the whole week without the performance of a single stroke of work. I did this in retaliation. Saturday night, he called upon me as usual for my week's wages. I told him I had no wages. I had done no work that week. Here we were upon the point of coming to blows. He raved and swore his determination to get a hold of me. I did not allow myself a single word, but was resolved if he laid the weight of his hand upon me, it should be blow for blow. He did not strike me, but told me that he would find me in constant employ employment in the future. I thought the matter over during the next day, Sunday, and finally resolved upon the third day of September as the day upon which I would make a second attempt to secure my freedom. I now had three weeks during which to prepare for my journey. Early on Monday morning, before Master Hugh had time to make any engagement for me, I went out and got employment of Mr. Butler at a shipyard near the drawbridge upon what is called the city block, thus making it necessary for him to seek employment for me. At the end of the week, I brought him between eight and nine dollars. He seemed very well pleased and asked why I did not do the same the week before. He little knew what my plans were. My object in working steadily was to remove any suspicion he might entertain of my intent to run away. And in this, I succeeded admirably. I suppose he thought I was never better satisfied with my condition than at the very time during which I was planning my escape. The second week, the second week passed and again, I carried him my full wages. And so well pleased was he that he gave me 25 cents, quite a large sum for a slaveholder to give a slave, and bade me to make a good use of it. I told him I would. Things went on without very soothingly indeed, but within there was trouble. It is impossible for me to describe my feelings at the time of my co uh, contemplated start drew near. I had a number of warm hearted friends in Baltimore, friends that I loved almost as I did my life. And the thought of being separated from him, them forever was painful beyond expression. It is my opinion that thousands would escape from slavery who now remain before the strong cords of affection that bind them to their friends. The thought of leaving my friends was decidedly the most painful thought with which I had to contend. The love of them was my tender point and shook my decision more than all things else. Besides the pain of separation, the dread and apprehension of failure exceeded what I had experienced at my first attempt. The appalling defeat I then sustained returned to torment me. I felt assured if I failed in this attempt, my case would be a hopeless one. It would seal my fate as a slave forever. I could not hope to get off with anything less than the severest punishment and being placed beyond the means of escape. It required no very vivid imagination to depict the most frightful scenes through which I should have to pass in case I failed. The wretchedness of slavery, the blessedness of freedom were perpetually before me. It was life and death with me, but I remained firm 
And according to my resolution on the third day of September, 1838, I left my chains and succeeded in reaching New York without the slightest interruption of any kind. How I did so, what means I adopted, what direction I traveled, and by what mode of conveyance I must leave unexplained for the reasons before mentioned. I have been frequently asked how I felt when I found myself in a free state. I have never been able to answer the question with any satisfaction to myself. It was a moment of the highest excitement I ever experienced. I suppose I felt as one may imagine the unarmed mariner to feel when he is rescued by a friendly man of war from the pursuit of a pirate. In writing to a dear friend immediately after my arrival in New York, I said I felt like one who had escaped a den of hungry lions. This state of mind, however, very soon subsided. And I, and I was again seized with a feeling of great insecurity and loneliness. I was yet liable to be taken back and subjected to all the tortures of slavery. This in, an, in itself was enough to damp the ardor of my enthusiasm, but the loneliness overcame me. There I was in the midst of thousands and yet a perfect stranger without home, without friends, in the midst of thousands of my own brethren, children of a common father, and yet I dared not to unfold to any one of them my sad condition. I was afraid to speak to anyone for fear of speaking to the wrong one, and thereby falling into the hands of money-loving kidnappers whose business it was to lie in wait for the panting fugitive as the ferocious beasts of the forest lie in wait for their prey. The motto which I adopted when I started from slavery was this, trust no man. I saw in every white man an enemy and in almost every colored man cause for distrust. It was a most painful situation and to understand it, one must needs experience it or imagine himself in similar circumstances. Let him be a fugitive slave in a strange land, a land given up to be the hunting ground for slaveholders whose inhabitants are legalized kidnappers, where he is every moment subjected to the terrible liability of being seized upon by his fellow men as the hideous crocodile seizes upon his prey. I say, let him place himself in my situation without home or friends, without money or credit, wanting shelter and no one to give it, wanting bread and no money to buy it. And at the same time, let him feel that he is pursued by merciless men hunters and in total darkness as to what to do, where to go, or where to stay. Perfectly helpless both as to the means of defense and means of escape. In the midst of plenty, yet suffering the terrible gnawings of hunger. In the midst of houses, yet having no home. Among fellow men, yet feeling as if in the midst of wild beasts whose greediness to swallow up the trembling and half famished fugitive is only equaled by that with which the monsters of the deep swallow up the helpless fish upon which they subsist. I say, let him be placed in this most trying situation. The situation in which I was placed, then and not till then, will he fully appreciate the hardships of and know how to sympathize with the toil-worn and whip-scarred fugitive slave. Thank heaven, I remained but a short time in this distressed situation. I was relieved from it by the humane hand of Mr. David Ruggles, whose vigilance, kindness, and perseverance I shall never forget. I am glad of an opportunity to express as far as words can the love and gratitude I bear him. Mr. Ruggles is now afflicted with blindness and is himself in need of the same kind of offices which he was once so forward in the performance of toward others. I had been in New York but a few days when Mr. Ruggles sought me out and very kindly took me to his boarding house at the corner of Church and Les Bernard Streets. Mr. Ruggles was then very deeply engaged in the memorable Darg case, as well as attending to a number of other fugitive slaves, devising ways and means for their successful escape and though watched and hemmed in on almost every side, he seemed to be more than a match for his enemies. Very soon after I went to Mr. Ruggles, he wished to know of me where I wanted to go as he deemed it unsafe for me to remain in New York. I told him I, I was a caulker 
and should like to go where I could get work. I thought of going to Canada, but he decided against it in favor of my going to New Bedford, thinking I should be able to get work there at my trade. At this time, Anna, my intended wife, came on. For I wrote to her immediately after my arrival in New York, notwithstanding my homelessness, houselessness, and helpless condition, informing her of my successful flight and wishing her to come on forthwith. In a few days after her arrival, Mr. Ruggle called in the Reverend J.W.C. Pennington, who in the presence of Mr. Ruggles, Mrs. Michaels, and two, two or three others performed the marriage ceremony and gave us a certificate of which the following is an exact copy. This may certify that I joined together in holy mat matrimony, Frederick Johnson and Anna Murray as man and wife in the presence of Mr. David Ruggles and Mrs. Michaels, James W.C. Pennington, New York, September 15, 1838. Upon receiving this certificate and a $5 bill from Mr. Ruggles, I shouldered one part of our baggage and Anna took up the other, and we set out forthwith to make passage on board of the steamboat John W. Richmond for Newport on our way to New Bedford. Mr. Ruggles gave me a letter to a Mr. Shaw in Newport and told me in case my money did not serve me to New Bedford, to stop in Newport and obtain further assistance. But upon our arrival in Newport, we were so anxious to get to a place of safety that notwithstanding we lacked the necessary money to pay our fare, we decided to take seats in the stage and promised to pay when we got to New Bedford. We were encouraged to do this by two excellent gentlemen, residents of New Bedford, whose names I afterward ascertained to be Joseph Ricketson and William C. Tabor. They seemed at once to understand our circumstances and gave us such an assurance of their friendliness and put us fully at ease in their presence. It was good indeed to meet with such friends at such a time. Upon reaching New Bedford, we were directed to the house of Mr. Nathan Johnson, by whom we were kindly received and hospitably provided for. Both Mr. and Mrs. Johnson took a deep and lively interest in our welfare. They proved themselves quite worthy of the name of abolitionists. When the stage driver found us unable to pay our fare, he held on upon our baggage as security for the debt. I had but to mention the fact to Mr. Johnson and he forthwith advanced the money. We now began to feel a degree of safety and to prepare ourselves for the duties and responsibilities of life of freedom. On the morning after our arrival in New Bedford, while at the breakfast table, the question arose as to what name I should be called by. The name given me by my mother was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. I, however, had dispensed with the two middle names long before I left Maryland, so that I was generally known by the name Frederick Bailey. I started from Baltimore bearing the name of Stanley. When I got to New York, I again changed my name to Frederick Johnson and thought that would be the last change. But when I got to New Bedford, I found it necessary again to change my name. The reason of this necessity was that there were so many Johnsons in New Bedford, it was already quite difficult to distinguish between them. I gave Mr. Johnson the privilege of choosing me a name, but told him he must not take from me the name of Frederick. I must hold on to that to preserve a sense of my identity. Mr. Johnson had just been reading The Lady of the Lake and at once suggested that my name be Douglas. From that time until now, I have been called Frederick Douglas. And as I am more widely known by that name than by either of the others, I shall continue to use it as my own. I was quite disappointed at the general appearance of things in New Bedford. The impression which I had received respecting the character and condition of the people of the North, I found to be singularly erroneous. I had very strangely supposed while in slavery that few of the comforts and scarcely any of the luxuries of life were enjoyed at the North compared with what were enjoyed by the slave, slaveholders of the South. 
I probably came to this conclusion from the fact that Northern people owned no slaves. I suppose that they were about upon a level with the non-slave holding populations of the South. I knew they were exceedingly poor and I had been accustomed to regard their poverty as a necessary consequence of their being non-slave holders. I had somehow imbibed the opinion that in the absence of slaves, there could be no wealth and very little refinement. And upon coming to the North, I expected to meet with rough, hard-handed and uncultivated population living in the most Spartan-like simplicity, knowing nothing of the ease, luxury, pomp, and grandeur of Southern slaveholders. Such being my conjectures, anyone acquainted with the appearance of New Bedford may very readily infer how palpably I must have seen my mistake. In the afternoon of the day which I reached New Bedford, I visited the wharves to take a view of the shipping. Here I found myself surrounded with the strongest proofs of wealth. Lying at the wharves and riding in the stream, I saw many ships of the finest model in the best order and of the lar largest size. Upon the right and left, I was walled in by granite warehouses of the widest dimensions stowed to their utmost capacity with the ne ne uh, necessaries and comforts of life. And added to this, almost every body seemed to be at work, but noisily so compared with what I had been accustomed to in Baltimore. There were no loud songs heard from those engaged in loading and unloading the ships. I had heard no deep oaths or horrid curses on the laborer. I saw no whipping of men, but all seemed to go smoothly on. Every man appeared to understand his work and went at it with a sober yet cheer cheerful earnestness, which betokened the deep interest which he felt in what he was doing, as well as a sense of his own dignity as a man. To me, this looked exceedingly strange. From the wharves I strolled around and over the town gazing with wonder and admiration of the splendid churches, beautiful dwellings, and finely cultivated gardens, evincing an amount of wealth, comfort, taste, and refinement such as I had never seen in any part of slaveholding Maryland. Everything looked clean, new, and beautiful. I saw few or no dilapidated houses with poverty-stricken inmates, no half-naked children and barefooted women, such as I had been accustomed to see in Hillsboro, Easton, St. Michael's, and Baltimore. The people looked more able, stronger, healthier, and happier than those of Maryland. I was for once made glad by a view of extreme wealth without being saddened by seeing extreme poverty. But the most astonishing as well as the most interesting thing to me was the condition of the colored people, a great many of whom, like myself, had escaped thither as a refuge from the hunters of men. I found many who had not been seven years out of their chains, living in finer houses, and evidently enjoying more of the comforts of life than the average of slaveholders in Maryland. I will venture to assert that my friend, Mr. Nathan Johnson, of whom I can say with a grateful heart, I was hungry and he gave me meat. I was thirsty and he gave me drink. I was a stranger and he took me in lived in a neater house, dined at a better table, took paid for and read more newspapers, better understood the moral, religious and political character of the nation than nine tenths of the slaveholders in Tab Talbot County, Maryland. Yet Mr. Johnson was a working man. His hands were hardened by toil and, and not his alone, but those also of Mrs. Johnson. I found the colored people much more spirited than I had supposed they would be. I found among them a determination to protect each other from the bloodthirsty kidnapper at all hazards. Soon after my arrival, I was told of a circumstance which illustrated their spirit. A colored man and a fugitive slave were on unfriendly terms. The former was heard to threaten the latter with informing his master of his whereabouts. Straight away, a meeting was called among the colored people under the stereotype notice, business of importance. The betrayer was invited to attend. The people came at the appointed hour and organized the meeting by appointing a very religious old gentleman as president, who I believe made a prayer after which he addressed the meeting as follows. Friends, we have got him here, and I would recommend that you young men just take him outside the door and kill him. With this, a number of them bolted at him, but they were intercepted by some more timid than themselves and the betrayer escaped their vengeance and has not been seen in New Bedford since. 
I believe there have been no more such threats, and should there be hereafter, I doubt not that death would be the consequences. I found employment the third day after my arrival. In stowing a sloop with a load of oil, it was a new, dirty, and hard work for me, but I went at it with a glad heart and a willing hand. I was now my own master. It was a happy moment the rapture of which can be understood only by those who have been slaves. It was the first work, the reward of which was to be entirely my own. There was no Master Hugh standing ready the moment I earned the money to rob me of it. I worked that day with a pleasure I had never before experienced. I was at work for myself and newly married wife. It was to me the starting point of a new existence. When I got through with that job, I went in pursuit of a job of caulking, but such was the strength of prejudice against color among the white caulkers that they refused to work with me, and of course I could get no employment. Finding my trade of no immediate benefit, I threw off my caulking hub hubalibit and prepared myself to do any kind of work I could get to do. Mr. Johnson kindly let me have his wood horse and saw and I very soon found myself a plenty of work. There was no work too hard, none too dirty. I was ready to saw wood, shovel coal, carry wood, sweep the chimney or, or roll oil caskets, all of which I did for nearly three years in New Bedford before I became known to the anti-slavery world. In about four months after I went to New Bedford, there came a young man to me and inquired if I did not wish to take the liberator. liberator. I told him I did. But just having made my escape from slavery, I remarked that I was unable to pay for it then. I, however, finally became a subscriber to it. The paper came and I, and I read it from week to week with such feelings as it would be quite idle for me to attempt to describe. The paper became my meat and my drink. My soul was set all on fire. Its sympathy for my brethren in bonds, its scathing denunciations of slaveholders, its faithful exposures of slavery, and its powerful attacks upon the upholders of the institution sent a thrill of joy through my soul, such as I had never felt before. I had not long been a reader of the Liberator before I got a pretty correct idea of the principles, measures, and spirits of the anti-slavery reform. I took right hold of the cause. I could do but little. But what I could, I did with a joyful heart and never felt happier than when in an anti-slavery meeting, I seldom had much to say at the meetings because what I wanted to say was said so much better by others. But while attending an anti-slavery convention at Nantucket on the 11th of August, 1841, I felt strongly moved to speak and was at the same time much urged to do so by Mr. William C. Coffin, a gentleman who had heard me speak in the Colored People's Meeting at New Bedford. It was a severe cross and I took it up reluctantly. The truth was, I felt myself a slave and the idea of speaking to white people weighed me down. I spoke but a few moments when I felt a degree of freedom and said what I desired with considerable ease. From that time until now, I have been engaged in pleading the cause of my brethren. With what success and what, with what devotion, I leave those acquainted with my labors to decide. You know, it's tough, tough to read that. Most people that are descendants of enslaved people can only imagine the horrors and the nightmare that their ancestors went through. And to read a firsthand account from my ancestor, it's very tough no matter how many times I've read it over my lifetime. 